Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Aurora. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, Level 2, Lesson 3, July 19th, 2023. If you see that something is new in me right now, it's because I'm walking on a treadmill because not only has my body said, hey, I don't want to sit for three hours and I need to jump up more than once per class, but I actually want to walk at a slow pace and even do some work, clearing work and protective work with my crystals while mm -hmm. I walk and talk with you. So of course, I'm distracting. Oh, let me just change the audio. Just make sure everyone's <laughs> Not because I don't love you, just because there's a little bit of background noise. I have to squint for be able to see this. Um, so yes, if you see me moving slightly on your screen, it's because I'm moving and I was actually just talking with Charlie kind of before we got going on class here. I actually find it a lot more comfortable to be able to keep moving because I am a waveform. And so like walking at a slow pace while I do something like make my music or something else like that, it's actually very comfortable to me. Uh, so yeah, just... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to be apologetic either, like saying like, I hope it's not a problem because I have to be in charge of myself. Um, so thank you. That's what's new with me. And it also feels like a new leveling up in terms of my lasagna activity, because now I'm doing a lot of lasagna activity while I'm on a treadmill, kind of walking at a slow pace. And it's actually really quite amazing. And it, it actually, and this is just totally outside of class, which is sharing. I find it kind of helpful because sometimes I want to just be in my own world and close my eyes. It's different than if you're walking outside and you have to be attentive to your environment or, you know, carry a handbag or any of these different things, carry groceries. It's just very, very different when all I have to do is like focus on the movement of my limbs. So it's uh, very, very fantastic. So um, Pedro opened up the chat by saying hello rectifiers. And I love that because I wanted to speak a little bit outside of my notes and also welcome, welcome new people. And so new people, I almost always send out the class link and also notes from my PDF, which I make available to everyone, the Flying Rainbow Lasagna Flight Manual. And hi, Lisa, good to see you too. Um, 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 um. And then I always promptly diverge from my notes. So this is actually very normal for me. Uh, I will get to the notes, but I also, you know, I've been teaching my class for over 10 years. I always keep it relevant to what we are experiencing in personal development, personal spiritual attainment, and also planetary unfolding of, uh, um, you know, our um, spiritual goals. Try not to call it like spiritual battle and things like that. I'm still trying to just find different words for it and different different framing for what we're experiencing. But one of the um, great insights that I've had recently, you know, as I do my genetic work of flying rainbow lasagna -ing, this is more than an artistic expression. It is not arbitrary, it is not random. The reference to rectifiers is appropriate because this is about a rectification, a return to the pristine nature of your DNA code in the way that it was intended. It was intended as something that is constantly divinely connected, um, not creating cellular decrepitude or metabolic aging, and certainly not heading towards death. And so that's been very consistent through all of my sharings of all of the many years that I've been here. And more recently within the past two years, and I'm gonna reference now what I just call the millimeter wave or the substrate of lies, simply in order not to poke any hornet's nests or have any problems with the particular platforms that I share upon. But you guys know what I'm talking about when I talk about these things. Um, to me, it is not merely a uh, telecommunications grid it is a millimeter wave that also carries a story. It carries a narrative story that is um, a non-truthful reality, a negative, harmful, and corrosive reality that is trying to be attempted perpetration upon your cells and upon your DNA. So hold on one moment. I'm going to grab my, my whiteboard here and I'm gonna draw this for you because I'm almost always more comfortable speaking with pictures than I am just with my flapping up and moving mouth parts. Okay, so, oh no, okay, good, wait, okay. Collapse that and now let's just draw a simple cell. Here is your cell membrane. That's a terrible cell. Oh guys, bear with me. This pen doesn't always work and then I'm like, I'm trying to make it a nice circle. Okay, much better. That's a much happier looking cell. The other cell looked very sad. And let's just make purple the color for your nucleus. That's your nuclear membrane. 
and then let's scribble some purple DNA in there. That's your DNA, but it's unfurled in the form of chromatin. So it's lots of strings of DNA that are dancing and moving about at a very, very fast pace, okay? Now let's draw something poop colored. This is like a tower over here. Here's like a tower. And then here's the poop rays that come off of there, the millimeter rays. And so the cell membrane of your cell membranes, plural of your body are incredibly important biological features. You think with your brain, but you also have cognitive events that happen that are focused on the activities of your cell membrane. So for example, like if this little square guy over here is a hormone or something that is a, a signaler, it brings cells signals and information. It has to come through the cell membrane. So your cell membrane is filled with all of these little keys, doorways, and apertures that um, act, uh, act, are acted upon and act and receive tiny molecular messengers. And what happens is basically stimuli come from the outer world. That can be another cell in your body, or the extracellular fluid, or even something that's way, way, this is way over here, this is like outside of your epidermis, stimuli come from somewhere and hit the cell membrane. And then the cell membrane does stuff. It Maybe it says, no, you can't come in. Or maybe it says, yes, you can come in. Or maybe it says you can lodge here par partially and you can do a thing. Like it makes all of these choices and decisions, which is what I'm talking about in terms of a cognitive event. Then let's get another color. Oh, you guys didn't even know you were going to get a biology lesson today. These green strings are protein structures. And of course, I'm simplifying it. There's all sorts of wonderful protein structures that um, fill the cytoplasm or the area between your cell membrane and your nuclear membrane. And they bring signals and stuff from over here to over here. All right. So you get stories from outside of you, the membrane of your cells. And I do like the work of Bruce Lipton. And he talks about this a lot, that you have like your brain here, cognitive event, and you have your membranes of your cells, which you just it's the similar phoneme brain and brain. But you also are experiencing forms of thinking, metabolic um, cell to cell communication, decision-making nodes and events that are happening at the level of the cell membrane, and that those thought events are affecting this guy right here, your nucleus of your cells or nuclei of your cells and the DNA that is inside of there. So this is all relevant to what I'm trying to tell you today because when you have something like this that is extremely unnatural, so these types of um, radiation and stories that are carried upon this wave, do not come from the sun. You know something, x-rays come from the sun, gamma rays come from the sun, optical light comes from the sun, infrared light comes from the sun, um, millimeter waves, substrate of lies, does not come from the sun, comes from whatever, you know, like a tower that might be put up by your shopping center or something like that, or it comes from Starlink satellites in the sky. It's totally not a naturally occurring information source. And there are many, many, many questions that can be asked when you get down to the sense of what is actually information and where does it come from? And who is, if these are thoughts in a mind, who is the mind or is there a mind or is it an impersonal mind or is it no mind? Many, 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 many questions and a lot of philosophy. And I don't want to drive away any new people that are like, what did I get myself into? This is the first class that they're here for. Please don't run away. Because um, no, no, I don't always go this deep into meta um, the questions. But the stories that are being carried on 5G are not biologically positive. They are in many ways corrosive. So it's not just a false story in the sense that it has an impact on your DNA. Like that, you know, I'm, I'm using brown as the poop color. Poop color comes in and then it jiggles your proteins and tells a story to your DNA over here. And that story might be something like instead of, um, you woke up in the morning and you decided to get in your car and drive to the store and buy coconut milk for your coffee. I always use that as the example, but it might have a totally different story where it's like, no, you wake up in the morning and instead you drive to the nearest lake and you're, you submerge your car and, you know, destroy your car. Like these are like huge exaggerations, but you understand like something that is wildly divergent, far, far, far from your usual behavior patterns and path very destructive to you, destructive to your community, and usually like random, arbitrary, and not really serving a positive purpose. And that's one aspect of what can happen, but you can also, because 
blah, 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 because your DNA is a bridge of light that connects to your abstract time body. And the behaviors of your DNA, as I put down my little thing so that I can gesture, the behaviors of your DNA as it is in its normal oscillative behavior, and then you can also fly in rainbow lasagna within those normal behaviors. As your DNA is twisting and morphing and re replicating itself and doing its dosy -si dos and doing all these different types of things, it is creating waveforms, and those waveforms are waveforms of time. You are not only submerged in a sea of events, you are emanating wavelets that are the events that derive from you. And so this is basically a way of hacking DNA and hacking your system. In this sense, the word hack meaning gaining access that is unauthorized access. So you and I, we have DNA. Wait, I'll turn back to me and maybe I'll come back to that picture. But you and I, we have DNA. And that's a very, very special thing. It's You could even say literally, it is the purpose for your being. Like, why did you come here and get a body? Why did I become a walk-in and come here and get a body? Wouldn't life be so much easier if I was on an interdimensional cloud and I didn't have to have a body and worry about the grocery store and other vagaries of life? Um, but yeah, I wouldn't have DNA. And DNA is absolutely essential for my mission. I could do flying rainbow lasagna within various different media. Anything that can carry a waveform, I can lasagna, but I got some DNA by being in this body. So look, you have to look at this. I talk about when you get a body and that it is kind of like an audition process. Like, good job, kid. You passed the audition. You got to be born. That's a success story. And also the fact that you've been living for however many decades and avoiding the membrane of death successfully for however many decades. Again, good job, kid. Um, but also when you signed up here, you signed up to be a carrier of DNA, a bearer of DNA, because you are part of a continuum of consciousness, of light, of events, of biological information that is really part of a much, much, much larger biological supercomputer. And you are one note. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me turn on my sound for musicians. Now you can finally hear my, my silliness over here. Um, you're one note in a symphony. Can you hear that? I didn't know what it would sound like. My settings are all weird. You are part of a symphony. Your generation is one note in a much, much larger, longer story of music. And you bear a responsibility, both to everything that has been played before you in the symphony of life and also to everything that will come after you. So part of it is about protecting you and saying, hey, I have these personal boundaries, I have these energetic boundaries, this is me, and I'm supposed to be the person in charge of me. I'm supposed to be the person in charge of determining my body structure, my body behavior, states of health and metabolism, my relationship to my ecosystem or how I relate to other people and living things in my life and the decisions that I make. And it's very, very similar to having a car. Like if you're driving a car, you're in charge and you're responsible. If you give somebody else the driver's seat or somebody else the keys to your car, then they're like, yoink, thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to take the car and I'll drive it into a lake or plow it into people or do something horrible and negative with it. But it's your car. You must never allow your vehicle to be taken hijacked and mispurposed in that way. It's literally part of why you pass the audition because you bear a sacred responsibility to be a musician in this very, very, very long heritage of bringing this music through time. And the music that you carry inside of you is part of just something that's so large and so meaningful and so profound. So the poop rays, the stuff that I drew in um, brown over there, that stuff that is trying to subvert not only your life, but the entire music of the galaxy, multiple parallel timelines, everything everywhere. And why do I bring this up? You're like, Aurora, it's making me kind of mad. I don't really like what you're talking about. Put on the nice music again. I will. And you can also find my nice music and I will share it on my Patreon and other good things like that. Um, because I, I would rather just listen to nice, cool, awesome music too. I refer to all of this because in my inner work, rectifying the DNA of this body that I have entered into, I have found the millimeter wave activating a lot of disempowerment codes or tendencies that are um, active or dormant within the DNA structure. And I talked about epigenetics, like expressed DNA or potential DNA. And these stories are all about like whether or not you're allowed to fight back, 
whether or not you're allowed to shoot back, whether or not you're allowed to reflect back, all of these things. And I realized very recently, like within the past couple of days, that humanity has been under what could be called a binding spell. Um, that's like using very specific, you know, types of cultural context words for, um, you know, the um, esoteric societies and the types of work that they do. So put it in loose air quotes, but let's say a disempowerment contextualization. That really is the mispurposing of the sacrifice of a great teacher who came here 2000 years ago that we know as Jesus Christ that that person's sacrifice, first of all, when a person dies, it releases an enormous amount of energy. And when it's done as a sacrifice, be either willing or unwilling or witting or unwitting, then the energy of that death and of that life force is purposed. And sometimes it's mispurposed. So it's put towards some end. So um, like, you know, a sacrifice can be done in order to achieve some amazing positive intention, which is what I see his life, his life and his teachings came here to set humanity free and not just humanity, but literally all life came to bring all life into a, a more um, um, uh, closely connected to Christ, uh, Christ centered uh, experience and to be a step on the path to personal and planetary ascension. His death and the story of his the circumstances surrounding his death and the mispurpose mispurposing and this contextualization for that has been used as a disempowerment story and implanted in your DNA. So you guys know that humanity has been genetically modified for a long time. Technically, this is less than 18 stuff, but we're not, we're not mincing around on eggshells for another several months before I actually talk about this. That's why I tell you I always give you the present day weather report and I always tell you things that are relevant to where you presently are in your journey. So this is what we all need to be talking about and knowing about this week. Then I will get into the flying rainbow lasagna and non-duality, which is the, the stuff that I wrote from 10 years ago. Um, there are many times humanity has been genetically modified, including things that were like snip, snip. Now we're going to implant into your DNA something like the tendency to worship, the tendency to worship something external as if it is deity. And worship is not the same as like adore or respect, but the sense of like putting something over you in terms of authority and saying, you're more than me, please, oh, please tell me what to do. That's actually a genetic implant. So there are intellectual, cognitive and behavioral implants that are tendencies that have been placed into humanity artificially by genetic engineers that have been trying to suppress humanity and diminish you on your journey. And it's worth knowing about them so that you can supersede them, so that you know that those are artificial um, um, accoutrements or accessories or things that were done to you, not your natural state. And this disempowerment scenario about not being allowed to shoot back is another one. So when I say shoot back, I'm really talking about your DNA itself has a purification, a self-purification and self-defense mechanism. Now I'm going to go back, hold on a second to my wonderful whiteboards because now I want to talk about water, the fourth state of water. Ba, ba, ba. Water has a fourth state that is somewhere between a liquid and a solid and is kind of like a gel. And let's get some blue color. That's this. It is highly organized water. And you have highly organized water in your cytoplasm and you also have highly organized water in your extracellular fluid and in your blood and throughout the tissues of your body. And let's draw some DNA now. So this is close up like uh, here, we're zooming out and making it bigger close up of your DNA over here. And you know that I'm drawing it in this flat simplified form, but you guys know at this point that it's more than just a flattened out waveform and that it's highly three dimensional and it's doing stuff. And it's um, not like a flat S curve. Um, here is structured water. Structured water actually exists in an envelope that surrounds your DNA and bonds to your DNA in hydrogen bonds. So it surrounds the surface of your DNA and let's draw a little hydrogen bonds. This is an object not drawn to scale. These are just artistic, but let's show like there are bonds there between these objects, these molecules. And of course, I've already explained to you a lot in this class that your DNA is constantly dancing and doing stuff. 
So your DNA is moving and dancing. It's hydrogen bonded to water and water is intelligent and is a carrier for information. Here's my wonderful structured water and it's a carrier of information. It's a carrier of light. And if you watch that wonderful TED talk from uh, Dr. Pollock about the fourth phase of water, he's really an expert on that. Did that 10 years ago when TED talks were still a little bit more um, um, you know, cutting edge and um, truthful not um, suppressed and uh, diluted. He talks about how the fourth phase of water is achieved when water droplets are extremely structured within the liquid form and that the exclusion zone or the area of negative charge around a, a water droplet increases in the presence of light in the presence specifically of sunlight specifically infrared light if you take my path of light class which I will restart very soon you know that infrared, which we experience as heat, is also an, a form of light or a form of intelligence and information. So what you've got in the natural pristine state of your DNA is DNA surrounded by an envelope of light. That is called water. Structured water is an envelope of light. Structure your water, people. And you can structure your water very, very simply by putting it in the properly shaped carafe and then placing it in sunlight for you know, a certain amount of time. And you can also get those wonderful silica drops because they give a tiny molecular structure for the water to actually coalesce around. Helps for the water to have like little tiny minerals to coalesce around. So that's what is supposed to be giving your DNA information. What is supposed to be giving you stories about your life, about getting in the car in the morning and driving to the store and getting coconut milk for your coffee is highly structured water that has a ton of information in it and a ton of information comes from the structure of water itself and also from the sun stars and network of light that's what's supposed to be jiggling your dna deep inside of the nuclei of your cells and definitely not this crapola that does not come from the sun that is something that is an aberration that should not even be in existence so when that stuff that should not be in existence tries to come in and jiggle this stuff, what should happen is it should get bounced away. Here it is being bounced away. Kapow! Going off in this direction. Wait, let's, let's draw it in a better way so you get a more dynamic sense. Here's that poop crapola coming in, but your DNA says, no, kapow! Go off in that direction. Uh, a very, you could think of it as law of reflection, like what you send out comes back to you because it's very much return to sender. But it is also the sense of like the multifacets of a polygon or the activity of Merkaba, which is star tetrahedron, which I do have a little tiny one over here, but I don't know if you can see it very effectively in the lighting conditions here. There you go. You can see it pretty well because this is just made out of a dark um, obsidian or something like that. But a star tetrahedron, so it has facets. You know, so it's different than something that is spherical or um, you know, curvilinear like my lasagna. And those facets very, very specifically reflect and bounce off, send back energy that is not supposed to enter into your energy field. Send those stories away. Get them the F out of you. They're not supposed to be in you. So there has been basically this disempowerment agenda and artificial overlay on your DNA that has said, you're not allowed to fight back. Turn the other cheek is one of the things that it says. Love thy neighbor is another one of the things that it says. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that forgive others is another one that it says. And tell me, let me tell you. Let me tell you, girl. Um, these are very, very beautiful, high-minded ideals. And they should be applied to living, ensouled people like you, or a dog, or a tree, or an organism something alive that is multicellular, that has a soul and a consciousness. And the impulses that we receive from the substrate of lives, the poop crapola in brown, pictured here in brown, um, is not alive. It is not a consciousness. It is not a person that doesn't have personhood. It's it, um, an abstract energy, but not like I'm an abstract energy. I'm an abstract energy with personhood. Um, but it is a non-personalized, non-personified energy field. And um, in, the, in my interactions with it and assessments of it, you know, it really tries to skate on that a lot, kind of like 
Nanny nanny poo poo, I don't have responsibility. It, there's no I. There's no I. I'm, I'm talking for it. There's no I. There's no person here. So it's, you know, it's harming people a lot. So if you were a crazy person with a machete and you ran around like chopping people's heads off, that would be on you. And you'd be like, I have to take responsibility for all the horrible blood and guts that I made. And you would. But what if you're just an abstract energy impulse and you went around chopping people's heads off, doing all sorts of mayhem and bad stuff with your energy? And you were just energy, and you weren't a person, and you weren't uh, personified, and you didn't have a soul. It would may mean that you didn't face responsibility. But it also means you don't have to for offer it the other cheek. You don't have to do forgiveness. You don't have to do that for this particular thing because it's not even an entity or an organism. That's on one basic level of being allowed, like as you're moving through this thought structure with me, kind of clearing away the cobwebs and the things that have been like holding your, your hands back in your DNA, preventing your DNA from being able to perform these maneuvers of sending the energy out and sending the bad stories away. So no, one, number one, please know that this is not an entity, it is not a personified being. You don't have to offer it forgiveness as you would offer your neighbor. Your neighbor, your neighbor is that person who, who lives next door, not an emission from a uh, uh, telecommunications tower. That's not your neighbor. That is not your neighbor. Um, but more to the point, anything, even if it were a personified individual with a soul that is trying to come inside of your DNA is basically trying to break the sacred contract that you made in coming here and receiving a body where you said, this is my car and I'm the driver of my car and I get to be in charge of the stories that I participate in and emanate into the world. And so that's also big because you do not, you are not obliged in any way to allow anyone to create a false narrative, cut and paste it into your DNA and then that's something that you have to live out. Um, you must actually, as your greatest duty in being alive, basic red chakra stuff, and as your duty to God, the divine creator, not a biblical personification of an anthropomorphic God, but the abstract, creative, and sustaining field, the force field that has allowed you to be in existence. Yes, you are in a love relationship and a reciprocal rapport with that force field. It's like, I'm gonna make you alive. You're like, cool, I'm gonna be alive. It's like, and you have responsibilities too. I'm like, mom, like clean your room, except it's not clean your room, it's protect your DNA. Protect your DNA. Don't let crapola come inside of your DNA because you have a responsibility because your DNA is emanating. You're a singer in a band, all of you, and not just you, every single bacterium in your tummy. I have a lot of them, you all do. Every single bacterium that's on the surface of your skin, that's in your environment, that is digesting things in the leaf litter of your mulch of your garden, that's my dog, my dog's tummy, um, all trees, all insect life, you would think of it as an almost uncountable number of cell membranes that have been assaulted in this. And here's the deal. I would, I'm not even gonna get to the whiteboard to draw it for you. When you have a cell membrane, it's like this, all right? And then here's how a cell divides. Bloop, bloop, right? It divides, mama cell, big, mama cell gets big and then divides into two daughter cells. But the membrane stays the same same outer covering. So anything that that membrane learned, like it learned like, oh, like whenever this stuff comes into your environment, act like this, or when this stuff happens, act like this, or when this story enters into you, then this is what's going to happen. That's ancestral knowledge that gets passed on, bloop, bloop, to the daughter cells. And then the daughter cells take that information and they carry it on to their daughter cells. So it's not just DNA in your cells that is being passed on to the future generations, which is literally what helps you to proliferate through time. You know, I talked about your body of 235 and your body of 347, your cell membrane. Your cell membrane carries information from the you of the past into the you of the present and into the you of the future. And that these harmful millimeter waves they basically jiggle the fats of your body with lies and they put a, a lie story into those membranes which then gets passed down into future generations daughter cells and that lie might be about like becoming dehydrated or misshapen dried up like a prune or um to have other levels of cellular decrepitude or to become cancerous or other fun stuff i'm being facetious um no to have uh, any other levels of metabolic failure 
That is what's been going on from this substrate of lies. So on the one hand, the substrate of lies is a mechanical impulse, energy impulse, that is making chakras go askew, away from the central core timeline where you are in eternity and where you're um, constantly renewing and cellularly regenerating and staying alive, staying alive. Um, it tells a story and it also literally drives your car off the road. So this is my big wake up call to myself and everyone that you know I, I connect with and that I speak to, that you honor God and you honor Christ when you fling those stories away from you shoot them return them back to sender that because okay now we will have a, a long philosophical discussion aurora what if i just transmute it because i know everybody's good everybody that i'm connected to you're all good you're all like we're good we're good we want to be non-violent we don't want to hurt other people of course you don't and so if you just said i will take all of the slings and arrows hit me with everything you got don't hit me with everything you got but if you said that and you're like i will just transmute it um, then literally you would go into a huge energy deficit because a lot of this is about just simple um, math, like a pl plus one, negative one. If someone takes energy away from you, you now have negative one. Um, and your energy is somewhere else where it's not supposed to be. And it's a deformation of the cosmos. And so if you just I'll go with the, the uh, disempowerment scenario that's programmed into your DNA and you're like, I'm going to be good and I'm not going to shoot back, then it means that your energy stays with your attacker and the entire cosmos is deformed because you're following an artificially inserted mandate not to fight back effectively. And when you fight back effectively, what you do first is you send back the story that is an artificial story that was placed inside of you, but you also receive back or maintain your true energy. So if someone wanted to put you into energy deficit, like they want to take either one dollar away from you or a million dollars away from you, that's like how they make you die. Yeah, I'm gonna take away all your life force energy away from you. And you're like, I'll just transmute it. Like, no, you will simply die. And then there's that whole thing of Christian martyrdom of people saying, okay, great, you can take all my energy away from me and then I'll just go to heaven and then I'll be so ha happy. No, please don't do it. And I'm being a little bit facetious, but I'm never mocking true Christians or anybody that has a deeply held belief. But I'm saying that it is a facetious, reductionist, simplistic approach that is not effective because you don't want to die in order to go to heaven. You want to stay alive in order to go to heaven and experience a completely different level of metabolic and cellular health. So we want to tell your body and your cells a completely different story. A completely different story. No, it's not okay for energy weapons to attack you. No, it's not okay for energy weapons or fiends or entities or organizations or anything to take energy away from you. And that it is your sacred duty to protect your DNA, prevent artificial, harmful, corrosive stories and lies from being placed inside of them, prevent yourself or your community from living out those lies and shooting back those lies to the originator, return to sender, because when you do that, they don't keep shooting you. So from my experiences with this thing, if you're just like, oh, I'll just take that energy and transmute it, it's like, oh, this is a fun game. I will keep on shooting you again because there is no um, negative repercussion to what it does. And as soon as you begin um, shooting back effectively and accurately, then it stops or it has to change and reassess the validity of its behavior because it is now receiving damage. And I call it an it because it just is very simple, simpler, much simpler than trying to go into, who is it? Is it an entity? Is it an individual? Is it an organization? Is it a crazy person? Is it a psychopath? Is it, is it a man? Is it a god? Is it a devil? Is it a this? Is it that? You don't have to answer those difficult questions, which are a very tangled morass. All you have to do is re re send it back. All you have to do is my little Merkaba. Fling! Fling, 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 send it back. That's all you have to do. You don't have to analyze it. You have to be like, hmm, here's a bunch of poop. Let's chemically analyze it. No, don't analyze the poop that is being thrown at you. You simply send it back. And this is something that it might take a little bit of conscious, um, um, in, uh, like kind of getting going in order to do it. It should be second nature, should be first nature. It should be, as I'm trying to come up with the right words, an innate, natural behavior, an aspect of who you are as a free and feral 
human being consciousness at large in the world. Uh, there are all of these firewalls of protection that were placed into DNA itself so that when you have these DNA containers, something else isn't going to hijack them. There's a reason why these other things, or this thing, or whatever it is that flings poop everywhere, doesn't have DNA. It didn't pass the audition. It's not supposed to have DNA. It's not supposed to uh, exhibit its psychopathology into the world. It's not supposed to think its thoughts into being. But you are supposed to think your thoughts into being, and you're supposed to learn and grow. That's the forgiveness, learning and growing, living in community type of stuff. Like, hey, we're all here learning and growing. Forgive me, I did a wrong thing, and I forgive you too. That's what that teaching was. But the teaching is not about um, allowing this poop thing to come and uh, fry your DNA and put a lot of false stories into your DNA and in, including into the planet and then ask to be forgiven. That is not the essence of nonviolence or the essence of Christianity or the essence of what it is to be in Christ or the honor of the great teacher of 2000 years ago. So I am encouraging everyone to take off the shackles, take off the behavioral constraints that tell you you're a bad person if you shoot back. You're a bad person. You won't go to Christian heaven if you shoot these things back. If the energy weapons shoot a story at you and then you dare to protect yourself and reflect it back, that somehow you will be deemed unworthy. Far from it. You will be deemed worthy and a galactic citizen and a person who is truly living up to the responsibilities of what it is to be here in a body container. So very, very big revolutionary stuff. That's not part of the notes or anything like that. That's just really what I had to share in order to encourage everybody on our path. That's the energetic weather report right now. And I even wrote a song called Shooting Back, that that is the energy that is in that song. And again, you, I don't have to justify this by saying like, it's not aggressive and it's this and that. You can be aggressive if you wanted to. You could do a preemptive strike. If you could see the future and you'd be like, that guy's gonna shoot me. Or that, that thing is going to throw poop at me. You can be like, I will just make sure that it doesn't even get a chance to poop on me. You can do that. Um, but really what you're doing is if there's an impulse coming at you, you like kind of grab the arrow, like, oh, great, thanks for that arrow, and you send it directly back to where it belongs. Send it directly back to where it belongs. And this also is a personal empowerment that does not require an intermediary. So there's a lot of stuff um, in the world of spirituality and religion that asks for an intermediary, like an archangel or someone else, someone bigger, again, the externalization and worship program that is running very strongly here, that says, someone else, please, oh please, stop those arrows from coming at me, or someone else, please, oh please, look, I've got a bunch of arrows stuck in me, please take them out and neutralize them and send them back to where they belong. That is very much like the kid in the high chair. Like, you're a kid in a high chair, you're like, mommy, daddy, somebody help me, someone's shooting arrows at me and it is an infantilization of you when you are truly supposed to be divine, empowered beings, and if someone is shooting arrows at you, you should be empowered to collect that, I wanna call it ammo. Get it, because I don't wanna have keyword problems, but you get those materials that have been weaponized against you and expertly, in a very focused way, send them back to their origins because then the origins of whatever it is, if it's a tower, if it's an organization, if it's a consciousness, if it's a spaceship, if it's another planet, if it's another dimension, whatever is sending out doo-doos, send it back and it gets the message. It gets, it gets poked in its own eye from that and that that is essential because, okay, there's this whole contextualization like, blah, 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 the limitations were placed on you and that's going to cause peace. Can you tell that I'm really being sarcastic? That it's kind of like saying they're gonna neuter you. Like you're too strong and you're too feral and intimidating in your truthful state. So they're gonna neuter you. And then they're gonna say that it's for the cause of peace and that we're gonna stop the fighting, but it doesn't stop the fighting at all. All it does is mean that you become the uh, perpetual victim. And that is in many ways what Christianity and belief in Christ is framed as perpetual victimhood. And I do not align with that at all. And I do not teach others to align with that. And I really want you to um, completely throw, throw off that burden 
and know that you're still loved and appreciated and celebrated in Christ and you're still going to go to heaven, definitely, because um, that's one of the big behavioral control things. And, you know, it used to be an inquisition that said, if you don't believe in the Pope and if you don't believe this and if you don't believe this, then you won't go to heaven and you suffer in hell. But now it's just a different flavor of stuff that's basically, you know, like your planet is getting fried. And if, you, if you're a bad girl or a bad boy and you do the wrong thing, then, then you'll go to hell and you won't get saved in Christian heaven. It's just very, very, very harmful. These are all corrosive lies that you must clear out of your being. Don't perpetrate those lies. Don't believe in them. Don't marinate in them. And then after you clean out those lies, you've got to tell your body a better story. I do this work in healing my own body and in sessions of healing other people's bodies. But you take out the negative story that's about like desiccating your cells and becoming metabolically dead and all these different things. Put in a better story. And the better story is, oh, you know you can cellularly regenerate. Oh, you know, you can actually get healthier and better and, and not get more decrepit. Oh, you know, you can actually receive this nutrient and it can actually change and um, revolutionize um, your experience. And you can have a safe, long, happy, comfortable experience um, for many, many years. Um, you have to put in a different and better story. And so please begin this as an intellectual process during your day. Because I did this a little bit talking about like the buffet as you are offered very many different thoughts on the hors d'oeuvres tray of life. Like, would you like to think this poopy thought? Would you like to think this judgment and that's wrong radio and all these different things? Be like, no, I don't want to think these things. Um, but at this point, many things are shoved down your throat. You don't even make a conscious choice about what you're thinking. You have to be a super warrior. This is creating of your energy boundaries where you say, I recognize these thoughts as being implanted, forced inside of me, unwelcome invaders, and I send them back. I reflect them out, I get them out of me. And this also goes uh, retroactively, because essentially what has happened is those or that which has attacked and assaulted humanity with energy has given you all of the ammo that you need to kick ASS in a major way. You've got so many arrows stored up in you. Think of every single cell membrane that's been subjected to all of these different false narrative, harmful stories and frequency weapons and directed energy weapons, not just you, but again, dogs, cats, microbes, and trees. Everything on this planet has been assaulted. The planet herself has been assaulted. You have so much ammo that you can use in terms of the energy world to send it back that thing has really created the circumstances for its own defeat and obliteration. And that obliteration must happen because there is not a way for you to simply live happily in peace. Happily in peace, because we all want to be in peace, right? But you can't just live happily in peace while that thing is in existence because that thing is going to say, you know what I'm going to do? Hey kid, I'm going to neuter you, but I'm not going to neuter me. That's how we're going to have peace. We're going to have me endlessly abusing you. This is not me. But that thing, personified, says it chooses the role of the endless abuser and you can be the endless victim and that is supposed peace. It is not peace, it is the antithesis of peace. So that thing has pretty much created the circumstances for its complete eradication by, in the disempowerment scenario, giving you everything that you need to fight back. And then, now the flip, the switch is flipped when you actually get the message. You're getting, you're getting a cellular message right now to your cells of your body that are like, you're not supposed to get cancer. Send those messages back. Send all these bad stories back. Guess what, guys? Your planet is not supposed to die in a nuclear conflagration. Send that story back. Guess what, guys? You're not supposed to all die of starvation and food deprivation through whatever famines are created. Send that all back. You know, you can, you're starting to resonate with this. You're like, wait, that sounds like stuff out of the Bible. Yeah, I know. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible and the Hindu scriptures and uh, Viking literature and all of these different, or Viking, um, you know, oral tales. A lot of places that have been put um, grooming you for this sense of these false stories to accept them as somehow a necessary part of the attainment that we are all seeking. But you really can and should send back all of those negative stories that have been put into you that are about the death of your planet and the death of your physical body. Send it all back. And then you, you make room for the actual truthful story, which is the story of cellular regeneration, renewal, 
the non-necessity of death, and definitely the non-necessity of death of this planet. And guess what? This doesn't just affect this planet, this affects the entire solar system, galaxies, multiple galaxies, multiple parallel timelines, multiple dimensions, because this has been an incredibly large conflagration of things going into DNA that are not supposed to go into DNA. So it's not just this um, generation, not just this generation, that's got hijackers trying to jump inside of it, previous generations, down into previous ancestors, different star systems before there was even life on Earth. That's how far back this conflict goes. So when you return to sender, you're not only returning to sender for you here in this time moment, you're returning it for all of your ancestors, all of your progeny, all of these other time places that you've come from and that you've lived, whatever, the Liran star system, ancient concurrent Atlantis and Lemuria, and all of that, send it all back. It's an enormous rectification that is going on right now. Yeah, all right, very, very good. I know, I would like to just continue to play music and talk with you guys. We're gonna get serious and actually do class. Pedro has a question, he says, like Star Wars, where Jedi deflect or redirect or return the attacks with the lightsabers. Very, very much like Star Wars. Let me speak to that a little bit because Star Wars is very much an artifact of human anthropomorphic anthropocentric consciousness. Star Wars in reality uh, don't happen like that, although there are many, many conflicts or wars that are happening at the levels of star systems. But Star Wars in terms of human fiction and science fiction is really just like human ego problems in space, or I could joke about it as I sometimes do and I say mommy issues in space, or maybe daddy issues in space. So here's the deal in terms of being a Jedi. You've got your lightsaber. Wait, let me put this down. Here's my lightsaber, right? And the other guy's trying to do something to you, and you're like, wong, wong, wong. You're like fighting with light. But in truthfulness of reality, we don't fight with light. Yeah. I'm melting here. You don't fight with light. Light is information, and it is the but you could call it the generative substance of reality. It is consciousness, pure information, sentience, and data. It is not something that one shoots one another with. Don't shoot other people or beings or organisms or places with light. So we don't fight with light. It's hard. Uh, it's a disrespect of light, is what I'm trying to say. Light is nourishment. You know what I'm talking about? Light is supposed to be nourishment and divine intelligence and it is not something that we shoot each other with. So I come from that place where light is pure sustenance. And when I came here into this world, then a couple of times I was just exposed to these concepts and ideas and practices. And I was like shooting someone with light, like that is wrong on a basic level, incomprehensible. I was like, what? Incomprehensible, like we don't do that where I come from. How could you, why would you? It's just not, what is done with light. So that's a complete misappropriation of light. But um, on the more um, relevant to your comment, the sense of deflecting. So in, within that you know, flawed anthropocentric um, narrative structure known as Star Wars, which I've only seen the original movies from a long time ago. I haven't seen the more recent ones, so I don't really know the whole entire oeuvre, but I know some of it. Um, that the Jedis are uh, altruistic and have a positive value system and that uh, they use violence and they use their psychic powers in a very certain way. And that is apt because this is Christ, non-denominational Christ, it's a higher dimensional capacitation, it is your highest and higher faculties, your connection to God self-consciousness, and you don't just use it to do something like win at a game of poker. You got it? Like as you are developing your mind centers up here and you're in a world where not everybody has that capacitation, if you have that, you have a great advantage over others. But just like Superman also, the, the super, superhero um, you know, contextualization, um, Superman doesn't just use his powers to go around like winning a foot race or, you know, winning a strongman contest. He's like, no, like, I'm actually, I'm here to protect the planet. I'm not just here to win the Olympics. And that's because of, like, good value system. 
that is appropriate. I want you guys to encompass and embody that as your approach to receiving your psychic gifts of you know mental strength and physical strength. Um, and um, I sometimes joke about this because my dog is a Jedi master and she uses her Jedi mind tricks to go around town and make everybody feed her like you know goodies and stuff like that. She really does. And I joke, I'm like, Cheeky's making you drop food on the floor. Like it's not fair. Um, but she does it. And one time she even made me drop like a whole entire piece of bacon. It was like that close to my mouth and all of a sudden it's on the floor. Like, I don't know how that happened, but she's magic. You should not use your magic for self-serving powers. That's what I'm trying to say. You should not just use it in order to feed your, uh, steal bacon from other people and feed yourself excessively as you walk around town. We are given these gifts and given these powers in order to serve the community, serve the ecosystem. And of course, by helping, uplifting, and protecting and serving the ecosystem, your community, other people around you in the world, you also help yourself. This is who and what I am and what I do as Aurora and as Flying Rainbow Lasagna, that it's actually incredibly important for me to, of course, protect myself and keep my own body healthy and receive all of the resources that I need to be sustained but people ask me this, or we joked about this many, many times. Like Aurora, if you're so fly, if if you're so flying rainbow lasagna, like why don't you sit on a golden toilet seat? Why don't you live in you know the most luxurious penthouse or blah blah blah? And my answer is because like I am busy manifesting a world that's good for everybody, not just me. That would be a misuse of like what you call Jedi um, psychic powers. So in the Star Wars oeuvre people who are Jedis try not to be the aggressor. It's kind of like in martial arts of uh, Asia where you're a black belt, you're like, you know, you don't throw the first punch. It's this year, these are culturalisms and they're positive, but I don't want you to be limited and disempowered because you're busy waiting for a horrible adversary to throw the first punch. If you are in Christ and you can see and um, sense and anticipate the future and you know that guy's going to throw the first punch, you can prevent it from happening. And you prevent not only your own suffering, but you prevent an enormous amount of suffering in time. Every time there are these distortions uh, in your own personal health, your personal being, and in your community, it doesn't just affect you, it affects all of time bad waves going through the entirety of time. And if you make enough bad waves, the entire time structure gets wibbly wobbly and out of control. We have got to that level or we have, we have reached that level here in this time place when there is so much gyrating wildly out of control because of so many un injustices and cosmic law being subverted so profoundly and the DNA of humans specifically in this time place being extremely distorted, sometimes by subcutaneous pollutions, sometimes by millimeter waves, some of which are subjected to voluntarily or consensually, some of which are not subjected to consensually or voluntarily. And so there are huge issues and questions about all of that too. Um, Rainbow asked me before, am I playing music? So yeah, I wanted to just do, a, I have my keyboard set up over here, I was playing music this morning, and I wanted to um, say, like, you know, if you're a chord in the longer symphony of, of time, that is what your DNA is playing. I want to play a chord like dun dun. But my piano is set up with all these crazy things for my music from this morning, so that that's what it sounded like. So I think that was appropriate. That's the cosmic music of your DNA. That's the concert that you're a part of, and you're an organism, and you're alive, and that's what you're what you're um, you're playing with your body. So that that's what that was. Um, so yeah, and I hope that that whatever. That's fine. I, I won't apologize. I'll stop apologizing. Pedro says, do higher beings have DNA or a higher dimension version? Superman powers come from light. Yeah, exactly. Superman gets his powers from that funky yellow sun because he come if he's, if Superman were still on kryptonite. Kids, I know this story. Um he would be a regular guy if his planet weren't destroyed and he was still on planet Krypton, then he would be a regular guy with regular amounts of strength surrounded by a bunch of other people who are regular in their amounts of strength and the only reason why he has super strength is because he came to our world where there is a yellow sun, different calibrations than planet Krypton, and so he's the one guy that's a lot more um, 
um, uh, empowered than the, all of the other earthlings and people around him. And so he, not being a megalomaniac power abuser, says, hmm, I have natural innate gifts and I'm more than the people around me. Instead of using my x-ray vision to like be a peeping Tom or you know, be disgusting or gross or whatever, I'm gonna use it to help people. If I can fly and I can revive people and do all these different amazing things, I'm gonna do it to fight evil and save lives and do a lot of good things. So, you know, it's just a completely different response to power. Like when some people receive power, they're like, wow, like I can really do stuff. I better do good stuff. And some people, when they receive power, they're like, wow, I can really do stuff. I want to hurt other people and be a maniac and I'm trying to make like an evil face. Um, yeah, take for myself, you know, kill everyone else. Take, take for myself. Some megalomaniacs would be like, get rid of all earthlings. Take over your planet now. And I think that was maybe a movie too. Okay. Just make sure I got to all of the chats while they're relevant. Then I will finally get into my notes, I promise. Um, so yeah, your question about um, do higher beings have DNA? So I am a higher dimensional being, Aurora, my collective. And I did at one point have DNA in the origins of where my consciousness came from, where my gestation as consciousness, when I transcended that level of consciousness through the ascension process and became an impulse of light on the stellar network, I didn't have DNA anymore. I had a light body made of photons or pure information, or pure data, or pure waveform. That is actually part of the motivation for me to create this oscillation and be able to come into a body that has DNA and to be able to sing a song with the strings of this instrument here in order to change this reality. Because when you are in a higher dimensional state of being on the path of light and just you're made of pure light, you emanate reality and you're empowered and you touch on many things, but you don't touch on them in the same way that you do when you are in a DNA body. And when you're in a DNA body, you're in the band and you're playing and you're doing stuff in the world of light. And when you are in the level of pure abstraction, you're in the levels of pure abstraction. So you have empowerment and you have responsibility, but you have transcended certain levels of interactivity. And then um, it's up to the current generation, you guys, to take care of the realm where DNA is an act, act, activity carrier, medium through which impulses are carried and reality is created and structured. And um, there were such profound diminishments and distortions in the level of DNA that I literally had to enter into a DNA body and show everyone, hey guys, like this is flying rainbow lasagna and this is how you change and restructure your DNA. And here's a new song that you can play that is the song of fixing everything up and making it better. Wait, let's play a, a little song of fixing everything up and make it better. Let's fix everything up and make it better. Fix everything up and make it a lot better. It's a Flying Rainbow Lasagna song. It's kind of a funny song. Wait, I want to play something. There we go. Better. I have to do a crazy crossover with my hands. That's why I'm walking at a very strange angle. Fix everything up and make it better. Okay, enough music for right now. We'll keep playing music on another day. Um, yeah, DNA is a physical molecular bridge and it's a connection to embodiment. When you are non-embodied, you don't have DNA as a bridge because you're kind of not needing to bridge into somethingness. You're in the realm of pure abstraction. So um, excellent question, Pedro. Thank you as always for participating and for your thoughts. Okay, mental sorbet, and now it's time to actually go into my notes. Wait, pull up my notes, and we are talking about, um, I have to squint and scroll, it's right here. Good. Flying rainbow lasagna and non-duality. Okay, and let me just drink a little bit of water. So duality means thing versus thing. And flying rainbow lasagna is literally a visual or graphic depiction of a shape that represents non-duality or the transcendence of thing versus thing. I'm also grabbing something else over here. Extreme close-up. This is called a Mobius strip. Mobius strip is an amazing impossible shape that was created by a Swedish mathematician named Mobius. 
And it's amazing and impossible because it only has one side. Almost all shapes have two sides, but not this shape. So for example, if I am on the outer surface of this shape, look here, I'm on the outer surface of this shape, and I'm gonna trace that outer surface without picking up my finger from the surface at all. Outside, 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 here. Outside, 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 inside, 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 inside outside 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 now my fingers at a funny angle but you see what I'm talking about outside 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 the inside and the outside fit together there's only one surface to this shape and there's only one edge only one edge it's actually the same edge all the way around to the linear mind that's an impossible like, that's impossible that's it I'm jumping out a window no it's not impossible it is the next highest dimension the way that things work in non-duality so an enormous amount of your perception of the world in terms of duality and thing versus thing um, and comparison and contrast as a way of perceiving the world with your five senses has to do with your optical vision. Most people here are sighted and most people here have two eyes. But you know, of course, respect and, and um, appreciation for anybody that I've got in my audience. People might be a listener if you're not sighted and some people might be monocular in your vision for whatever reason. I appreciate you. I'm happy that you're that you're part of my class too. But most people here, vision is their dominant sense, and most people have two eyes, and most people perceive the world through the minute calculations of the differences between what left eye is giving you and right eye is giving you. They're separated by whatever, you know, a couple of centimeters, and they give you two slightly different viewpoints of the world. And then your perception, which is your brain and your neurology, but also your consciousness, goes through this amazing um, real-time calculation or permutation where you are able to make um, an integration of these two viewpoints and then develop a sense of the world based upon that. So what I'm doing here on the screen, even though most of you have a flat screen, but I'm being like, one hand is closer, the other hand is closer. This represents depth. So it's a huge survival characteristic to be able to make comparisons between two things and be like, how far away is that thing? Like, how far away is that lion that's chasing after me? Or how far away is that thing that I'm chasing after that I'm trying to eat? Or whatever, berry that I'm trying to pluck and eat and stay alive. Um, depth perception through dualistic binocular vision. Also, the receptors in our eyes work through contrast. So in the screen here, when you're looking at your screen or when you're looking around your room, we look for edges. This is how we begin to develop a sense of making sense out of the world. I think that was terrible grammar. A sense of making sense out of the world. When you're a tiny infant, you receive optical information, but you kind of don't know what you're looking at yet. Like little babies, they're just kind of like, there's a thing, there's a thing, there's another thing. I don't know what the things are. Like I'm looking at things, I don't know what they are. It takes several months for a newborn human to even begin to understand what a face is. So what the brain is doing during that time of human cognitive and neurological development is it's looking for edges. And it kind of looks like if you look at my face, you're like, well, like, here's this color, but then there's this color, and then there's this edge. Something changes between this part here and this part here. And then if you go even further, then you're like, there's this part here, and then there's that part there. That's a different part there. And then at a certain point, you're able to determine like, like that's a person, that's empty space. That's, you know, like these are basic survival mechanisms, again, to be able to recognize your human caregiver and members of your community and then recognize what are things that are just objects in the environment. We develop a story and a sense of what our world is shaped like based on contrast thing versus thing. So we've got light versus dark, and in the tactile sense, you've got hot versus cold. And everything is relevant, of course, in terms of heat. Like, you, you know this. Um, but uh, we make comparisons so that we can tell delineations between um, like the surface temperature of the air versus the surface temperature of water. Like as you're putting your hand into a cold pool or a hot bath, you're like, I feel a thing is there because it's different than the stuff that I feel out here, like thing versus thing. This is called duality. And there's nothing inherently wrong with duality, but I will tell you that the dualistic 
approach and level of perception and experience is a stage of development, but not the end goal. Got it? And it also relates very, very much to achieving Christhood because when you are able to activate that insight, which is your inner eye, it's your eye of time, and it is your eye of, let's call it holistic presence, and I'll talk about being able to see time in a non-linear sense. You achieve a higher dimensional viewpoint that then mitigates dualism. It's not just left versus right, or hot versus cold, or one versus two, uh, sorry, I should say zero versus one, like a binary situation. You get a third option, and from that third option, it's just like building the dimensions. You're like, well, wait, if I can add another dimension this time, I can keep on adding another dimension. I can add another dimension infinitely and keep on getting the next facet. Facet, like a facet of a gem. So you get another facet and you're like, wait a minute, I just got a whole new viewpoint. And you're like, if that can happen once, it can happen again. Another facet, boom, another viewpoint. Another facet, boom, another viewpoint. Another facet, another facet, another facet. And you keep going on this amazing journey of achieving uh, multi-dimensional viewpoints. So what is the difference between linear experience of time and multi-dimensional experience of time, which is what it's like where I come from, my collective, which is technically outside of time space. So if you're going to look at linear time, we have like an old fashioned film strip. We talk about that a lot in this class, like movies that are made of film, where you start off with one frame, it's the beginning, then they all go in a line until you get to the end of the movie. And that's wherever the, the hero and the, the man and the woman, they kiss. And that's the end of the movie. Freeze frame, stop, end film. And that's your life, right? Birth to death. And you don't see all of those frames at once. You see them one at a time. They flicker past your eye. And due to the ocular phenomenon known as pers persistence of vision, you um, create a co connective integument between them. And it looks like flowing smooth motions, even though it's just a series of static images that are being presented to your consciousness. So this is also another big aspect of your consciousness building a picture of the world from your visual data. So all this visual data, like when you're a little baby, it's just raw data. It's a little hard for me to pour this while I'm also walking on the treadmill. Hold on a minute. Yeah, I'm doing, doing pretty good at coordinating everything while I'm walking at the same time. Sea of raw information, lots and lots of stuff, stuff and shapes and colors and stimuli. You're like, okay, it takes me a little while to kind of figure out what I am seeing and what, what I'm experiencing here. At a certain point, you become an expert. Through persistence of vision, these flashes of static images at the Planck length, your mind perception and um, eyesight apparatus. Um, draw them together into a continuum and animate space. You're the animator. You're animating space frame by frame and you're creating the connections between all of these static moments that makes it look like there's a real world here with all of these objects that are flowing and objects that are moving, but you're really the presence that is adding that motion and that sense of realness to the world. So that is the linear viewpoint. A film strip flashing in front of your face, 26 frames per second or faster. But the multidimensional view of time is if you were to take the film off of the projector, it's usually in these big giant round wheels, pull all of the tape off of the wheels, cut all of the frames into individual little pictures and lay every single one of those pictures out. Imagine on a giant table, like a giant banquet table, because it would be big because it would be all of the frames of the movie. But then you could stand back in at this giant banquet hall or stand up above it, and you could see the entirety of the whole movie laid out from the very, very first scene through all of the car chases and action scenes all the way up to the final scene where, of course, man and the woman hug or whatever is happening, that final moment, freeze frame, and then that's the end of the movie. That is what it is like to see the higher dimensional um, view of a life. That's what this is. So when I'm always sharing about this shape, these are mathematical abstractions and these are time currents and energy currents and they represent ser a series of events that you can perceive and that you can experience. If you are literate, 
So just like with music, I am still only becoming musically literate. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, so that means the capacity to read music like notes on a staff. It's actually taken me many, many years to kind of create that cognitive infrastructure and know like, what does it mean to be in the key of G and what does that look like in terms of musical notation? But for those who are fluent in music, they can look at the music that is written as a series of black dots on a musical staff, which I think you guys are mostly familiar with, and be like, oh, I can kind of imagine what that sounds like. Literate, meaning it doesn't just look like a bunch of abstract symbols. It is something that relates to a language. And that's what it's like when you are a higher dimensional being, when you are in Christ and you, you're literate. So not only sighted, but literate. Keep on using that word. So there's a big difference, just like in your own cognitive development of being a little tiny child, getting your eyes to work, getting your eyes to coordinate, learning about um, spatial relationships. This is what little children are doing. When you think that they're just coloring with crayons and making a mess, they're learning about spatial relationships, okay? I, I mean, like, I'm not a, a biological parent, but I've done a lot of um, caregiving, nannying, and babysitting. So I've cared for a lot of children, and so that's where this comes from. Like sometimes you think like, like kids are just like making a mess and smearing stuff all over, but like they're exploring spatial relationships and it can actually be really important for them to be given the opportunities to um, do this type of brain, brain learning, tactile um, um, plasticity and um, developing maps that they will then apply to their sensory experiences in adulthood. Even though it's not very much fun if they color on the walls with crayons or color on your white couch with crayons, be like, I'm exploring my sensorial um, information on the couch with crayons. Don't, that's not okay. I'm joking, you gotta be lighthearted about these things. Um, but the process of organizing your neurology into something that tells a truthful story about, about the world around you. And um, let me also go to my notes as I'm making sure that I don't forget anything that's really important Resolving duality, hold on. Resolving, okay, wait, wait. Um, changing perception that is required to make more than the zeroth dimension. Um, so as I talked about in previous classes, that initial cognitive leap from the zeroth dimension into the first dimension was an amazing miracle or unlikelihood and then once you do that, you can do it over and over and over again. So there's this initial leap from perceiving the world in dualistic opposition, contrast-based and thing versus thing, into recognizing a holistic presence, which is what I was trying to get to in terms of explaining time laid out before you on the banquet table. And when you look at everything all at once, that is what it is like when you are literate, which is also what I was trying to get to beyond merely organizing your ability to make sense of the physical stimuli to your eyes. When you go to school, after you've mastered your basic motor skills, then you become literate. And you learn that these little symbols on the chalkboard aren't just funny little things, they actually say stuff. When you become literate, you start to look at these shapes and the shapes that are on my dress and the shapes that are in the energy fields of human beings and trees and other things like that, and you can read them. You can read and accurately interpret them and comprehend that you contain information, most especially your DNA. So your DNA is a language. I think I shared that Solari um, series, which is very worthwhile, all about the numbers codes that are inherent, a lot of prime numbers and other good things in the um, atomic numbers and formations that are molecular formations in DNA. Fascinating stuff, and I'm a numbers person, and I love learning about that. Um, it's becoming literate. Like first, in order to become literate, um, you must recognize that a language is even being spoken. And you had to do that as a child auditorily. At first, it was just like lots of noises and sounds, blah, 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 blah. And you heard all these different things. But at a certain point, you're like, I keep hearing this one noise all the time. Maybe the noise is like, Aurora, Aurora. And then at a certain point, you're like, they're talking about me. That's the noise that means me or Charlie or Julia, whatever is your name. At a certain point, you imprint upon that. You're like, 
that's the noise that means me. And also like my dog, like my dog, she came with the name Cheeky and I didn't change that because that's the name that she has imprinted upon. Like when we say that word that we're talking about her, um, it's becoming literate in terms of the symbology of how we, what we are being presented with informationally. So when your third eye starts to turn on, you also activate your salience feature and you become semiotically aroused. Um, that means that you begin to accurately interpret symbol structures. But you have to be really cautious if you've only activated this chakra and not quite gotten up to the levels of abstraction because there is room for misinterpretation. So what it means to be semiotically aroused means that you're starting to read the um, coded information in your environment that comes through symbols. And it can come through numbers like, why am I always looking at the clock at 444? Like, why am I always seeing 1111s or, you know, whatever, master number codes or things like that. Like, I bought my groceries and it was, you know, 611. And then I looked at the clock and it was um, 1106 and, you know, all these different things. Like, you're like, something's going on here, but I don't quite know what. You're in that state of a child that's like, I'm hearing sounds, I'm hearing stuff, I hear a voice that sounds like Aurora. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but of course, like I didn't have the experience in childhood, but you know what I'm talking about, um, of imprinting on my name as a, as a human infant. But you know what I'm talking about. You're looking at the environment around you as speaking to you in symbols. Like here's an example. One time I was walking along with my dog and there was like a crumpled up lottery ticket that was on the ground. And I was thinking a particular thought just as I looked at the lottery ticket and the parts of the wording that were visible to me that said, win big. And that related to what I was thinking about. So I was like, wow, that's so interesting. My mind, my inside and my outside are relating to one another. That's lasagna. That's the Mobius strip. That is the recontextualization of your boundaries as a human being. Because in your early infancy, you go through a lot of creating boundaries and ego boundaries, and that's positive, because you're like, this is me, and then there's not me. This is a, a, another part of duality and contrast. You're like, face, not face. Me, not me. And light, not light. Food, not food. Babies do a lot of that. We do a lot of figuring out thing, not a thing. But that's when you are pre-verbal or pre-rational. Then you go through the experience of developing an ego and you become rational. And rational is like this. Why do things happen? And children go through that level of wonderful development too. Why is this? And why is this? And why is this? And that's why I sometimes joke in, in my little kid's voice, like, mommy, daddy, like, why this? And why is this? And why is this? Because it is a very childlike um, approach to uh, wonderment, wondering and wonderment. Why is this and why is this? And then at a certain point you reach adulthood and you're like, I know why. Uh, I know why this and I know why that. And you become rational. You're like, this happens because of this and this happens because of this and this happens because of this. But then at a certain point you become post-verbal and post-rational. And that is when you have gone into your true mind, which emanates from and is the aperture of right here. Your eye of pure insight, your eye of time, that has a completely different viewpoint of time than being embedded in a linear movie, but seeing the entire movie all at once. So when you are sighted, you can see everything on the banquet table. You're like, yeah, I can see all these different little individual frames of a person's life. When you are literate, you can read it and know the truth of it. Got it? So like being sighted means you can go into a, a library and open a book and you're like, there's squiggly lines. Have you ever looked at a language that you do not speak? You're like, yep, that looks like a bunch of squiggly lines. I don't know what it's saying, but there's something there. Um, very, very different than going through the whole process of actually learning how to decode that language and what it's actually saying. That's what it is like to be literate. When you can actually look at this shape perceive a person's energy field, look at the amazing permutations of experience represented in not only their genetic dance movements, but also the movements of their energy field and their flight through time, and then read that and interpret it accurately. And that is a holistic experience because here's what we don't do at the higher dimensional levels. You don't just tear out one page of the book and be like, this is you. 
this is all I'm going to read about you. You're like, that's my worst day. This is me shrinking like, my hair looked terrible. I didn't put on deodorant and I was, you know, whatever. I was very angry and upset all day. Like, don't judge me by, by that. You know, judge isn't even the right. Don't assess me just by that particular day. I'm a good person. Usually my hair looks good. Um, and that's truthful. Like when we are in the highest dimensional state, we look at every moment of a person's life as a lamination all the way back to your moment of your conception and how what you looked like as a zygote and what you looked like on the day of your emergence or birth into this world and what you looked like through all of your you know positive life experiences and through all of your real turmoils and real disasters it all adds up and it's all looked at and read with a pure love because it's not like a clips reel of your total life embarrassments. Um, you know, there's a cute movie that I still like and I like to reference it. It's very lighthearted. It's called Defending Your Life. It's from the 1980s. So it's, you know, kind of whatever, a little, a little bit of a vintage movie, but it's about this guy that dies and he goes to Judgment City. Judgment City. And he's got to defend his life and it's kind of like being in court. Except it's not very fair because you only get to choose certain days that you can present that are supposed to represent your soul and so you know the uh prosecutor chooses the worst days you know he has a lot of disasters he's like that's not who i really am look at me on this day and you know it's like trying to get into a good favorable next life experience kind of like being reborn uh, kind of like you know the sense of being judged in karma or something like that light-hearted non-literal movie very funny and cute um, but I bring that up because when you are truly assessed in your life assessment, it's not a clips reel of your embarrassments or the worst things that you've ever done. Many people have many things that they are in shame for, and I don't advocate for shame. That's another one of those shackles on your DNA. I don't advocate for the experience, for the behavioral response known as shame, that that is really anti-learning. Shame is a response that means like you don't even have the emotional energy to be able to learn from what you've experienced. Like you just melt, just melt. Um, that's not the purpose for being here at all. If, if a mistake is made, you can't be like, that's it, I'm just melting. I lose all structure. That's it. I'm just like evaporating away. Um, you have to maintain your structure and be like, wow, just definitely really effed up on that. And now I got to do something about it. That is the Superman response. Galactic citizen and and um, respons responsible to your environment and to yourself. Anybody can make a mistake, and you also see the contextualization of your mistakes and others when you are literate. So if someone were to say, "Clips real every time you made a mistake," I made so many mistakes coming here as a walk-in as Aurora. Some of them were light-hearted and funny social mishaps. Some of them were deeper and more profound mistakes. And some of them were tragic and um, um, perilous. Um, if you looked at all of them through the eyes of love, you'd be like, yeah, like Aurora really screwed up that and that and that. Some things, like I said, would be light-hearted and funny, but some things were really bad. Well, then what would you do? Would you say like, Aurora's a bad person. Send her to Christian hell. She's gonna suffer. You're gonna, you're going down. down like, you know, pro wrestling. You're going down. Um, no. You would say, well, after she made that mistake, what happened? Oh, she learned. And then she fixed it up. And then she did this and this. And then became a better person as a result. Or, you know, grew in various different ways from the experience. And also, I wouldn't say became a better person. Because I actually think that I came here as a good person, but I also think that, you know, you make mistakes out of I ignorance and innocence, and sometimes we hurt other people and it is not intentional, but then it's totally up to you about how you respond to that. Um, instead of going into carrying around guilt or feeling shame or any of these me melting um, disempowerment scenarios, for you to be like, okay, like I admit that that was not the best thing to do. What could, it, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better? How can I do better in the future? What can I do about this situation? That is the contextualization that literate Christs see when they assess you or look at, not even assessment because assessment is kind of like, like I'm the bouncer at a club and I'm going to determine whether you get in the VIP lounge or not. It's not like that. You're your own bouncer. You are 100% your own bouncer, but it's more the sense of when you perceive another organism in holistic, multidimensional, literate vision, you are able to assess and um, accurately know everything about that organism, including 
what was the response to mistakes, to learning experiences? Did learning occur or did denial occur or did jumping out the window occur or did escapism occur or some other form of denial? Um, that, that that's everything. That is everything in terms of this journey. So becoming literate in the sense of activating the higher dimensional perception, learning how to make sense or organize the information that comes in through that aperture and then becoming literate in your interpretation and decoding of those events. The greatest level of misperception happens when you're up here but you're not yet up here. Because when you're up here you're at the level of anthropocentric narratives, stories that are like once upon a time. But when you get to these levels up here you're like molecular bonding, one plus one equals two. That's the story. You know, there's a lot less of this like ascribing motivations and telling human stories. Like the, the world of human stories is very fraught and very open to misinterpretation. So you must be really careful. As your salience, which is your symbol reading structure, comes online with your inner higher vision, you must really be cautious about how you read and interpret symbols because us one symbol can mean this on this day, but then it can mean something totally different on another day. It is uh, an art form to being literate and comprehending this language. And it's actually easier from the higher dimension down, from the top down, when you can know the math and you're like, oh, particle A interacted with particle B and the end result was 0 0.17. That is, no one's gonna quibble with that. But when you have to go into this whole interpretation structure of what exactly did it mean when I read the lottery ticket and it said win big? What exactly did that mean? And did it mean this or did it mean this? Or did it refer to this or did it refer to this? That's when you start going into like endless death spirals or beach, beach ball of death, like the spinning beach ball of death. I don't know. Maybe it means this, maybe it means this, maybe it means this. When you see with true inner knowing, you just know and you don't have to quibble. So that that's really the truth of that. But it, that is a non rational set of cognitions that is when you are post rational when you achieve your higher dimensional viewpoint you become post rational so little babies are pre-rational grown-ups are rational and then those who are in spiritual attainment are post rational and that is when you know simply because you know and that is when you know simply because you have seen it and you have perceived it it is beyond an analysis and it is beyond intellectual justification. It is simply a deep knowing beyond intuition. Intuition is actually your guts down here, kind of slightly below your belly button. We're talking about insight, which is um, related to intuition, feeling state, but far supersedes feeling state and is more accurate. What is not as accurate as highest dimensional pure abstract math which is when you are truly literate and that's when you can truly navigate and um, uh, have an estimation, an accurate estimation of the behaviors, motivations, and um, structural integrity of other organisms. Like uh, if they believe, if they have integrity, if their actions match their words, what real impact they had on the world around them and what the true meaning of the movie is. Like when you see every frame of a person's life laid out and you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. What does it mean? And then you can, that's like a book club. You know, everybody's got a different interpretation of what the book means. I think it means this and I think it means this, but there actually is a real answer. Like one plus one equals two. There's a real answer about what your life really means but it's not something that is open to interpretation on the human level. It is on the abstract, highest dimensional, nonverbal level of multidimensional literacy. And that is what Christ is. Okay, so wait, I got through dualistic perception. I have to get to flying rainbow lasagna. So now we have to talk about time bubble. Cool, all right. In this time place, mostly the cosmology or story of how mommy, daddy, how did the world get here? Well, it got here through what science calls the Big Bang, which is a sense of a tiny, tiny, tiny thing that's really hot and stuffed with lots of stuff that all of a sudden starts to expand outward and creates a type of time bubble. And that on the surface of that bubble would be the moment now and everything that's on the inside of the bubble would be conceived of as the past. 
and science doesn't even really think about anything beyond the edge of the bubble. It's like out here, there's nothing out here. There's just the bubble. It's very, very limited um, cosmology and science is poised. Oh, I have to start this thing again. Sorry, if you hear beeping, it's because I'm starting my treadmill again. Here, it will do its thing. Sorry. Science has a very limited viewpoint that is like the viewpoint of a unicellular organism. And I joke with my tough guy voice. Hey, kid, I'm looking out for number one. There's only one of me. I don't care about any of you. That's science right now being like, there's only one universe. There's one big bang and one expansion, one version of this universe. And then, hey, kid, there's nothing else. I don't got to care about anything else. But of course, when you really start to wake up, you are a cell in a multicellular body. So you're like, wait, I'm in a universe and the universe is one cell and that ever expanding bubble is the cell membrane of one cell and I'm surrounded by trillions of other cells and that's the multidimensional universe or a multiverse that you're embedded within. And you actually do have to care about all those other cells because I joke about that. Hey, stop throwing your trash in our dimension. Like these things all interact. They all interrelate just like in your body. If one cell gets sick, the rest of your body is like, this isn't okay. We need to help that cell. And that actually help happens quite a lot. Um, melatonin is a, a helpful and protective precursor hormone that's in your body that is related to your pineal gland, but also heavily related to your mitochondria. When you have two different cells, like if this is the nice, healthy, plump cell, and this is the cell that's kind of like mushed up and not doing so great, the healthy cell is like, hey, neighbor, you're not looking so good. I'm gonna build a melatonin bridge. And I'm gonna send you some healthy mitochondria so that, that way you can get kind of plumped up. It's like, thanks neighbor, I'm feeling so much better now. You know, um, that is the essence of what it is to be in a multicellular organism. You're not just a kid looking out for number one. You are looking out for the trillions, the trillions, because it all adds up because your elbow cell must be healthy and your pancreas cell must be healthy. Everything must be healthy in order for the entirety to be maintained. That's the essence of time. That's what I was talking about in my, not rant, but my sharing at the beginning of this um, expression today that you are, through DNA, you're really connected to everything everywhere. DNA, that recognition is a huge part of unity consciousness. Unity consciousness is just recognizing that just by bearing consciousness, which is your I am presence, you are connected to all consciousness everywhere. That uh, consciousness is essentially non-delineated or not discrete, non-discrete, but flows through various multiple different states and although you, you are individuated and you are yourself and you are consciousness as this self state, when you get into higher dimensional perception that are analogous to becoming post rational, you're like, oh, I'm everything. Cause you come here as a little baby and you're like, I'm everything. And you're like you're pooping in your diaper, but you're everything, all right? Then you learn how to like be a little kid and you're like, no, like my name is Charlie or my name is Julia or my name is whatever. And then you're like, that's me. And then that's not me. I'm me, I'm not you, and that's positive ego development. But then when you get to levels of spiritual attainment, you're like, wow, I'm me, but I'm also you, and I'm also you, and I'm also that microbe, and I'm also that tree, and I'm also that dog. And that is supra-consciousness, or unity consciousness, that you attain again, except at that point, you are in control of your body, you are not pooping in diapers anymore, you are uh, achieving spiritual attainment. So, um, you know, you go through the ego state, and the individuation state, it is necessary and good and part of your development, but just not the end of the journey. A good stage, like when you are developing as a child, first you um, scoot, then you crawl, then you toddle, then you walk, then you run. And these are essential aspects of neurological development. The individuation and creation of the ego self-state story is a positive level of your development. So I'm not a kill your ego type of teacher person at all. I'm much more a love your ego, hone your ego, drop your baggage, become the most essential, um, you know, lean and essential um, part of who you are 
without any extraneous personality characteristics. That's all the periphery and the time um, timelines that are uh, far, far outliers at the periphery of your soul vision, let's call it, and just maintain the essence of who you are and you still have a personality, but it's your true personality. And that's the personality that is you as an ascended master. And that is also um, the stuff that you take with you when you travel like experts do star travel through the actual stars. You travel light, you don't bring your baggage, but you do bring some aspects of yourself. You bring your eternal being. Okay, so wait, I have to carefully pour some more water and then I have to talk about the flying rainbow lasagna and non-duality and show you very special picture that I actually squinted and scrolled before class. So it's all ready. Hold on a minute. It's share screen. Okay, and get the annotation before it jumps away. Good. This represents a cross section of two of yes, two tori. Wait, that annotation. You have PTSD about losing the annotation, guys. Okay. Here is the cross section of one Taurus, and it is superimposed. Here's the cross section of another Taurus. Okay? And let me just emphasize for you. Here's the singularity at the center of one torus or toroidal structure, the singularity at the center of the other toroidal structure, it is actually the same singularity. And what you're envisioning here is essentially the same torus that is jumping up and down or oscillating between two positions. So you can see me in the thumbnail here, lifting my sculpture up and down, vibrating it between two positions. So what you're seeing here is like a long exposure of the same basic energy structure, but being contextualized. Go back to my face. Because originally, just as science has the sense of the Big Bang and one universe with nothing around it, you've got the present moment now, the encapsulation, the cell membrane, the goo that's inside, that's the past, and then nothing outside of it. But as soon as you put that into a context, you put it into hyperspace. Hyperspace is the room that contains the room. So hyperspace would be considered or defined as the room that contains the universe. And because uni means one, universe, one story of the world. As soon as you put the universe into a box, like a fish tank or something like that, then you're like, oh, there's stuff. There's stuff around it. And that stuff represents the future potentials of the future. So science's model up until this point really doesn't recognize the future as something that actually exists. But when you contextualize the universe, you not only um, begin to achieve multidimensional perspective and recognize that there is a um, multiplicity of universes or multiverse, multidimensional space around you, you also recognize that the future is a thing. The future exists. So now we get back to a bubble would be something where the future and the past are discrete. The outside of this bubble never touches the inside of this bubble. Bubble is time and you can't cut the bubble because it's gonna get degraded. It's gonna go kablooey. So in that model, even as you recognize the truthfulness of the existence of both past and future and present, the future is something that cannot touch with the past. It doesn't interact, it doesn't relate. But when you are able to place this shape, which is essentially a super stretched beach ball of time or bubble of time, when you're able to put this into a superposition, put it into a fish tank or a box or a context or a hyperspace and move it up and down, what you end up getting is, first of all, the waveform known as the flying rainbow lasagna, but you also get, an, uh, I want to say, a loud solution, a non-conflictory solution like math and logic that doesn't negate any of the previously established cosmic truths that allows for the inside and the outside to communicate. And that's big stuff, because now I'm going to show you the flying rainbow lasagna 
as non-duality in a very similar way to the Mobius strip. Here's my finger. I'm a little ant. My finger is a little ant. And I'm walking on the outside surface of the flying rainbow lasagna. Walking, walking, walking. And then, oh, look at that. I just transitioned and now I'm walking on the inside surface of the lasagna. I didn't feel any different, but now I'm transitioning again. And now I'm walking on the outside, 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 inside, 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 outside, 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 inside, inside, inside. Flying rainbow lasagna, when you start to do this as a genetic maneuver, brings together your formerly divergent realms of inside and outside. And I'm not only talking about the inside of your epidermis, like where your guts are, and the outside of your epidermis, which is where everything that you define yourself as not me is. It's not that literal. So you're not going to vibrate like whatever, you know, your lymph out into the room and then back into the room. That is not what we're doing, okay? Just making that very clear. No. What we have defined as inside for most of human history are the things that are intangible and not easily sensed by the five physical senses. Your inside is largely defined as your cognitive events, your perception. So it's like your mind, stuff that you think, the stuff that you feel, your hopes, your dreams, your passion, literally your dreams, the things that you um, perceive and receive and think about when you're not paying attention to your five senses, when you sleep at night, it's all of your inside stuff that can't be weighed on a scale. And that includes something like an emotion. So science might not be able to formally recognize your dreams or something like that. Oh, hold on a second. Someone is barking down here. Hold on one second, guys. Let me pause this. Apologies for that brief interruption. She got her frozen dog food and she's very happy now. We're back to the sense of what is your internal world. Mostly things that can't be easily measured, weighed on a scale or measured in inches or centimeters. Like how many centimeters is your anger? Or how much does your passion weigh? How many ounces does your passion weigh? Can't really come up with those measurements. So um, objective materialist science has largely shied away from um, assessments of your interior world. Um, but your inner world is also your creativity, your imagination. How much does your imagination weigh? <laughs> these, these, these questions don't even make sense. Um, but the outer world, I'm like, I'm science, I'm like, outer world is my friend. Outer world we're very comfortable with. Be like, yeah, but I'll weigh whatever. A bunch of, a bag of garden soil. I can tell you how much that weighs. That's your outer world. The flying rainbow lasagna, in bringing together two formerly discrete worlds, blends together your inner world and your outer world. Blends together your passion and also your outer world of bags of garden soil. Might seem like a strange uh, thing to use as an example, but I, I plant my microgreens all the time, so that's part of my passion. My, my inner passion and my outer expression, but maybe a better example would be like my painting over here an outer expression of my inner imagination and the passions that I have for creativity expressed in the outer world. When we're talking about planetary ascension and spiritual attainment, we're really talking about a direct path of you as divine experienced co-creator in the, in the driver's seat, um, creating the world around you. From your thoughts and your feelings and your creativity creative life force energy or chi or prana, your passion, the things that you feel uh, deeply about or my music or something like that, and turning it into stuff that you can put into consensual reality. And um, in previous years, there's been a time lag to being able to do that. So everyone's been manifesting, um, but it just might have taken 20 years. So that would be like if you had an envisionment, a dream, like I really want to start uh, whatever it is a store, a farm, a family, build your dream house, whatever it was. It used to just take a very, very long time to actually bring that dream forward. Um, the, time, the time lag between um, creating a signal and sending it out and then actually having it transform reality structure was a long time. And we've been in an asymptotic curve, shaped like that, in terms of reality manifestation. So as we uh, came from, let's say, 
um, 2001, year 2000, 2001, that's when I walked in, and upward towards 2012, there was a lot of ramping up, getting faster. If you had a dream or a thought or something that was in your inner world, an impulse is a good word for it, your impulses were manifested. And that's also when people started to think more and know more about what people, like there's books about the secret or um, conscious ways of manifesting and manipulating reality structures. And that became more of a conversation, not just amongst smaller circles of seekers and those on the path of spiritual attainment, but you know, more workaday people, more materialistically focused people. In fact, quite a lot of materialistically focused people. Now it's all over Instagram, which is a very materialistic um, place and, and social, social, social space, I should say. Um, people are like, yup, I want stuff. Tell me what to think and do and I want to make, make stuff happen or get stuff. It might be like, bring me the man of my dreams. Or it might be like, I want that dress or that sun, those sunglasses. Or it might be like, I want a cruise in the, in the tropical zone. Um, it's usually materialism, a thing, a thing that will make people happy. Because that's coming from a certain level of inner development. Again, people who are like, where's golden toilet seat war? Because that thing that's going to make them happy. But I'm like, I actually am manifesting something larger and more expensive than a golden toilet seat that will actually make me much happier. And that is a totally transformed and pristine world where there is truly cosmic justice, meaning what you send out comes back to you, and pristine meaning untrammeled, like clean snow, um, a, clean, a clean canvas, clean canvas, where you get to make your realities and your imaginings happen without um, something else coming along and pooping all over it or limiting your free, accurate self-expression of your divine inner tendencies. Um, I really want to manifest a world where, when I say freedom, the horrible poop thing, substrate of lies, is like, oh goody, freedom, I'm free to poop all over. I'm like, no, not you, not the poop thing. No, freedom for those who have souls and divine connection to express themselves. And also that means the freedom to go away from that which you do not want to interact with. So a big problem on this planet is that there's been a lot of things placed into your mind's eye without your consent and you can't get away from it. That is erroneous in terms of cosmic law. Because in cosmic law, it's like, okay, you're free to poop all over, but I'm free to go away from your poop. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And then you would have a natural stratification of like, the heavy poop layers and the non-poop layers and those who are not interested in poops, I'm sorry I'm using that word so much, would go to the non-doo-doo layers. That would be cosmic law. But what if you've got a limited situation or an imprisonment or something that prevents you from um, stratifying and going to where you want to go? And then you're like, I don't want to be around this doo-doo, but something is making me listen to or experience or ingest this doo-doo and the doo-doo is thought forms that are not things that emanate from you and that are not things that emanate from divine consciousness and they are not worthy because they don't add up to longevity and coherence. It's stuff that you want to go away from because they're stories that are about disease and death and decrepitude and they're stories that literally destabilize the chakras and make them go wibbly wobbly like this causing the end result of your own destabilization. But these chakras, again, do not exist in a contextless void. They're in hyperspace and they're all connected. They're all connected to all of these other times, places, and reality structures of other beings. So if you destabilize one person, it's like, great, you just destabilize the entirety of everything. And if you stabilize one person, you're like, great, you just added stability to the entirety of everything. So of course, your personal attainment matters. Your day-to-day -day experience matters. What you do as a community and as a planet profoundly matters. And you're also radiating backwards in time and moving forwards into the future. So flying rainbow lasagna is a tool for non-duality in that oscillation that happens in both your energy field and in your DNA. What you end up being able to do is make your past and your future communicative. So here's, here's the future, here's your past, and here's the present moment now. 
And what you're able to do is actually fold the fabric of time, space, and consciousness so your past and your future can communicate. Past self and future self can communicate. I had a really beautiful meeting with um, a group of people in my community not very long ago. People told some very profound sharings about times when they were able to literally reach back into their own past and give a critical encouragement or um, like keep going or um, a sense of uh, decision making to themselves from their wiser future self literally reached back in time and said like you need to do this now life-changing positively life-altering life-sustaining they kept themselves alive by doing that and that is literally what we are doing for ourselves all the time as God spoiler alert you are God you are God and you're God remembering God's self and you're actually God experiencing non-linear time or living outside of the movie that you're presently embedded within. And you're absolutely there at so many critical junctures to send a very, very much needed impulse to yourself in this form where it's like, do this thing, you really need to do this thing. Or don't do this thing, you really need to not do this thing. And some of that comes in these messages of um, salience symbolic language, which is semiotics, and you have to be um, sensitized to it. And unfortunately, a great deal of our modern world desensitizes the human experiencer to semiotics and things that are truly divine symbols all around us. So there are um, pollutants in air, food and water, pharmaceutical pollutants, these things dead in the sensitivity of this sensor up here that is supposed to be a guide telling you where to go, follow the signs. Follow the signs, that's how you will know where to go. But when this is desensitized, you're like, I don't know, how do I read the signs? I don't know what are signs, what are signs and how do I read them? So it is something that is actually intuitively obvious or innately obvious when your sensor is active. But again, like when I talk about environmentals, there's fluoride that deadens things down. There's a lot of pharmaceuticals that deaden things down. There's a lot of illegal drugs that, or non-prescribed drugs, I should say, that people use to deaden themselves down. A lot of people don't like to be able to read the signs. They're like, I don't like the signs. The signs don't look good. Let's not listen, you know? So they kind of take stuff in order to not have to listen. But the signs are supposed to guide you. Your own pineal gland is supposed to be your homing beacon that brings you um, to spiritual attainment and the remembrance of your true state as God's self. And then you don't poof out of existence, you live as God. You're like, oh, I remember, I'm God, and I have a lot of stuff to do and fixing stuff up in this world. And we can talk about that too in terms of love and compassion towards self as God, because a lot of people here are like, Cosmic Complaints Department, I am not happy with what is going on down here. Somebody is responsible. And then you're like, I'm, I'm God, I'm, I'm responsible. <laughs> you're like, I'm a little, a little sheepish, a little sheepish. I'm responsible. But how do you have compassion towards yourself? You're like, how did this place get so messed up? And how did all these things happen? And uh, we want to go into a lot of um, blame and shame and finger pointing and stories. And uh, it's a long story. But what matters the most in the story is what is your response? When you're like, okay, like there's definitely screwed up SHIT around here. What am I going to do in response to the doo-doos that are here? And that is literally what makes you who you are. That is the definition of self. That is you being honed and refined towards your true story of who you are, the true nature of who you are. The answer is you do something. You do something and you do something effective and you get your SHIT together and whatever happened in the past that allowed these injustices to proliferate, you fix it, heal it, and then make sure that it doesn't repeat and happen again. So when I talk about resolving duality, again, this is not in um, apology or excuse mechanism for things that are aberrances, things that shouldn't exist. Um, and you know, we talk a lot in this class about the putis, those pesky occupiers of the interstices or residues of consciousness, so things that were never alive because they never passed the audition or that once were alive and failed, died horribly in some kind of 
time, Merkaba, distortion, explosion. And then they're like, help, I'm smeared on the edge of singularity. But also, I'm going to mess with your life right now. Like, none of that makes sense at all. Um, resolving duality in terms of recognizing continuity of consciousness does, should never be used as an excuse mechanism for people who made mistakes, did bad stuff, hurt a lot of people, and refused to change. This is also big because when you are God self and you're like, oops, I made a mistake, I recognize I made a mistake, and now it's time for me to change and fix it with a giant bucket and a giant mop. But that's very, very different than someone that says, I'm making these mistakes on purpose. I'm hurting people on purpose. Yep, I know I'm doing my math homework wrong, and I refuse to change. Those are two very, very, very different subsets of being. And one subset of being, like what you are, innocent or ignorant, making mistakes on the journey towards wisdom and learning. That's good. You're supposed to be doing that. But some stuff is not, and it is invalid, and it should not be in existence. So I used to use this example all the time when people came to visit my studio and I'm trying to tell them what flying rainbow lasagna is. It was when I was much less articulate than I am now. But imagine you're a little ant and you're walking on my hand. And half of the time you're, you're walking, you're not half of the time, all of the time you're walking towards my thumb. But half of the time my thumb is pointed in this direction and half of the time my thumb is pointed in this direction. I'm getting some kind of a notification, but it'll turn off in a second. Sorry if you hear something in the background. So you're always walking towards these levels of attainment or ascension or greater levels of focus and capacitation. Um, but God, that attainment, sometimes it's focused up here, sometimes it's focused down here, sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's this way. That is constantly always changing orientation. But your journey towards that state is always happening in one direction. I hope that wasn't too, too confusing. Your goal is always your goal, but your goal changes relative to your context. Um, time symmetry. Okay. Um, there is a singularity at both the top and the bottom of this flying river lasagna shape. It is a stable shape because of its symmetry. And resolving duality has to do with no longer being limited by the inside and the outside being perceived as two separate things. So basically the entirety of your life and of the structure of possibilities of your life becomes accessible to you and perceived in the moment now. And the entirety of your life and the entire structure of your life also includes not only one timeline, past, present, and future, but multiple timelines. So you've got multiple parallel worlds, even though they're not necessarily lined up like pencils you know, on a flat plane, like pencils on a desk or something like that. Um, but you have multiple timelines and reality structures that you are able to do your flying rainbow lasagna, lasagna dance within those parallel worlds. And when you do that dance, you're able to get information, salient information, which means like, what is relevant? You know, in this is a filter, like a decoder ring. And when you look at the world, there's a, like there's a lot of stuff here. What's the stuff that's meaningful? What's the stuff that's meaningful? And in your past and in your future, there are informations and viewpoints and things where it's like that's meaningful. That's meaningful. That's the meat and potatoes. Focus on that. And the rest is extraneous or simply not as worthy of your attention as other things. That's the essence of language, like the essence of language or even the essence of art. I had to learn this when I first came here as Aurora. So if you don't put something on a wall with a frame around it, people are going to be like, that's just a stupid thing. But if you put something on a wall with a frame around it, people are going to be like, that is art. Got it? Or on a, on a sculpture pedestal. Like there was one art show that I was at and someone had just left their reading glasses on a sculpture pedestal. It was an empty pedestal. They just left their glasses there. They just put it down. And someone else was looking at it, taking pictures of it. They're like, this is art. It's like, no. Somebody left their reading glasses on a pedestal. But that because in this culture, things are contextualized as something that is put on a pedestal is worthy of extra consideration. Something that is within a gold frame 
is art is within uh, contextualization that says, hey, everybody look at this. That is exactly what the salience feature of your higher faculties do, does. Says, hey, look at this. Important information over here, important information over here. So you just have to make sure that you're interpreting and reading that information accurately um, and um, uh, not misinterpreting it. But it, it kind of highlights the things that you should be focusing on with your attention. And as you vibrate into not only your past and your future, like you can vibrate with future self. Be like, I am facing a challenge. Future self, I'm going to vibrate into you and get the answer. How did you fix it or blah, blah, blah. You can also vibrate into parallel selves and be like, how did the me of that peripheral timeline over there respond to the situation? Or you can receive the imprint and information and um, positive influence from another person or another organism. You can fly in rainbow lasagna with not only yourself and versions of yourself, but with other successful organisms that either solved the puzzle or healed the disease or achieved the attainment. And you can be like, what, what's your recipe? And then you get the recipe as an imprint and then you go make the recipe with your own body. So again, this is very, very different than the sense of stealing, misappropriation, or taking something like you don't rip the pages out of a book. When you get DNA information from another alive organism, you get their imprint, but you leave the book behind. So that's how you treat library books respectfully. You don't get peanut butter and jelly on the pages and you don't tear out pages. You just read pages and you get the inspiration and then you go home with the in information that you have gotten inside of you. So you can get these levels of inspiration and information from another organism, like uh, a cat or a butterfly, or from different versions of humans or different versions of you in these various different places. When you can do that, that's a huge empowerment. It's a huge capacitation through this non-duality structure to be able to receive information from something beyond what you would define as self according to the terms of your epidermis. Let me read from my notes. By using the concept of the flying rainbow lasagna, we allow energy that is flowing on the inside of one surface with energy flowing on the outside of the surface. So there is no longer the inside versus the outside, there is just one side similar to the Mobius strip. When you begin to do this flying rainbow lasagna oscillation, you become seamlessly integrated with your environment. It's not just the sense of, this is my inside world, and my inner world, and my thoughts, and my dreams, and my imagination. Then there's the outside world, and the outside world is full of hard edge objects and things that never change in response to my thoughts. No, that is the former realm or paradigm that we are exiting, that is the realm of objective materialism. That says, hey kid, the wall is the wall, whether you think about it or whether you perceive it or not. Now I'm chomping my cigar, go get a job. And then there's the quantum world that's like, wow, the world and that wall is actually a series of waveforms and it's actually highly dependent upon whether I perceive it and when I'm looking at it, it does one thing and when I'm not looking at it, it does another thing. And then that means that my consciousness is hugely valuable and the act of observership is hugely valuable and it's a huge empowerment for me to know that and maybe I can look at the world differently with the ovens in front of my eyes and collapse these waveforms slightly differently and create different and interesting um, intentional patterns and edifices and experiences so that I can live a better life and this whole entire world can be structured in a better way. So it, when I talk about the inside and the outside and also I always point to this painting over my shoulder. Let me just see if you can see it effectively. That painting over my shoulder. It's the cover from uh, Birth of the Flying Rainbow Lasagna if you ever want to check out. That's a good album. Um, it shows the process that we're undergoing as a planet. And the planet also has enough arrows of the substrate of lies to be able to just successfully fight off any invader. Um, but we've been undergoing this transformation where your inner world becomes manifested as your outer world instantaneously. And in this class, as I've taught this material many times, we talk about um, different things that we've manifested. Get rid of that notification. <laughs> Sorry, it took a moment. 
Um, like I manifested tiny screws. <laughs> Here's my, my ongoing example that I use in order to share about this. I used to have like a big bucket of junk that was not junk, um, just random stuff, kind of like a tool bin that I would just throw everything. And then when I needed something for a project or whatever that I was building, I'd be like, do I have a thing? I need something that's roughly like this and like this and like this. Do I have one of those? I don't know. Let's check my big bucket of stuff. And what I would do is I wouldn't look with my eyes. I would just reach in with my hand, kind of fish around, be like, okay, I'm looking for one of these, one of these, one of these, and then see what I come up with. And a lot of the time I would get exactly what I needed. Like, I'm like, I need a tiny screw. It's got to be this size, this size, this size. And I reach in and out of all of that stuff that's in there, I come up with a tiny screw in exactly the right size. I'm like that, the statistical unlikelihood of that happening is astronomical from the objective materialist viewpoint and from the higher dimensional observership interpretation of reality i reached into a state of quantum indeterminacy and manifested a tiny screw as a piece of matter that i needed for my project and proved to myself like wow like i can make stuff if i need stuff and we have other people in this class who are lovely people one of whom manifested a wheelbarrow unintentionally because most people be like if you can manifest a wheelbarrow like why don't you manifest a brick of gold or something like that she's like because I needed a wheelbarrow in the moment um because everybody goes straight to that sense of like money manifest money and that's what you need but maybe that's not what you need and so we're in this realm of learning how to use our superpowers positively for the purposes of manifestation and you want to manifest positive coherent longevity life-giving life-sustaining activities organisms edifices and materials and you don't want to manifest destructive crapola nonsense uh distractions or pathogenesis pathogenesis would be like the creation of disease so i actually don't agree with a lot of new age shadow work and i don't agree with the assessment that you're somehow not good enough to go into the realm of the cosmic art studio and manifest things because you're all too traumatized and you're just going to manifest more trauma i don't agree with that at all what i actually think is that when you are given the magical paintbrush of your life and you are able to manifest intentionally and directly things that you wish to manifest you manifest your healing if you have trauma around any event or something that is unhealed inside of you, you don't just manifest it again. Like the example would be if you were raped or attacked or something like that. If it's unhealed and then you get the paintbrush of your life, you're not going to just paint another rape. And this works because our planet has been violated. Our planet has been invaded. Even if you are not physically violated or your boundaries violated in your body in this life, you're on a planet that's been violated. You're in a DNA code and in a cultural context where consciousness has been violated and you've definitely been violated by the substrate of lies and other errant signals that are very unwholesome, um, it doesn't mean it's gonna happen again. That's the fear that many trauma victims have, not victims, victim experiencers, survivors. They're like, oh no, it's gonna happen again. It doesn't have to happen again. So if you enter into this moment, kapow, you're in a state of quantum indeterminacy. You can make anything happen. You're like, oh no, I'm not healed. I'm not healed. I'm going to manifest bad stuff. No, it's not like that. It's not like all of your nightmares will all of a sudden come out like, scary clowns are chasing me. You know, it's not, that's not going to happen. You know what? If scary clowns chasing you is your big trauma and you got something bad happened to you when you were at the circus, you went to Ringling Brothers when you were three and something bad happened to you and it's been following you your whole life and it's not healed. When you go into the state of quantum indeterminacy and you can make anything happen, what you manifest is the healing of your clown trauma, the healing of the bad stuff that scared you in childhood, the healing of the things that um, haunted you throughout your life so that you don't have those fears anymore. You do not simply remanifest your fears. And that's a really important message and distinction to bring because this whole entire planet deals with the trauma of what is known as the fall from grace or the fall of consciousness, basically genetic diminishment. And as you are regaining your capacitation through flying rainbow lasagna, you're literally um, able to send to entropy and turn down the sound 
on signals that are non-life-giving and not coherent and not part of the pristine architecture of who you really are and keep aloud on the music the good music play the good music wait let's play play the good music these are the songs that you want wait Keep the songs that you want on your DNA. You're like, that's good. That's good. I like that. Ooh, I like that part too. Keep that part on the DNA. Keep that part. How about this part? How about this part? Ooh, keep that part. That part sounds good. That part sounds good. That part sounds good too. That part sounds good. That part sounds good. All those parts sound good. Keep all those good parts. You know what you can turn down the sound on? Cancer aging, decrepitude, and those are some of the things that are specifically the stories that are carried on the millimeter wave that reverberate with these implanted stories. It's like you've been groomed for the implantation of these um, d disaster stories and that telling you that it's going to be the end of the world and it's going to be the end of your life, it's going to be the end of you, and these reverberate to some very deep ancestral traumas. So when you are able to go into this moment of pure potential, which is what flying rainbow lasagna is, and planetary pure potential, it does not mean, oh no, you're gonna just manifest ancient Atlantis again. No, 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 no. In fact, what we're all doing is manifesting the healing of those traumas from ancient Atlantis. You're manifesting the solution or rectification of all of the bad things that happened that turned you from an immortal that's totally a super being and very very empowered into a blinded amnesiac vulnerable mortal that has you know a lot of problems and a lot of challenges just at surviving so um, the flying rainbow lasagna in terms of resolving duality here's the big teaching that I don't ever want to be miscontextualized not all levels of consciousness or impulses or characteristics are going to energy. Non-duality means that everything is consciousness and everything falls under the umbrella of God and divine presence. But some characteristics, energy impulses, tendencies, behaviors, organisms, fragments, whatever you would want to call them, some things are mistakes and they don't have longevity and they don't have coherence and they are not didactic, meaning they don't have a purpose in terms of teaching. They're just doo-doos and they should not be in existence. And those things go to entropy. And entropy is a state of non-being. It is not synonymous with Christian hell. Christian hell is a state of like torment and suffering wherein whatever is there, if it's consciousness or if it's residues or whatever it is, feels negative uncomfortable feelings and it's meant to be a behavioral control mechanism if you don't want to end up there don't do bad wrong stuff you'll end up suffering in that way that is not what entropy is entropy means no longer moving through time it means no longer experiencing entropy means no energy total no energy total frozenness total non-motivational non-volition so it's not like you're frozen but you're wanting to be unfrozen there is no wanting, there is no desire, there are no needs, there are no requirements. And unity consciousness occurs at that level of frozenness and non-being and non-information, even as unity consciousness occurs at the states of totality being, total fastness, total knowingness, infinite everything, infinite presence, that is usually what we define as God or divine everything. That's energy, energy up here. You and I, the true nature of who you truly are, we're going to energy. You're a good person, you make a mistake, you're like, oops, I made a mistake, let's fix it. You're going towards energy. When you, uh, I don't wanna say are a bad person, but when you're not responsible, and you're like, yeah, I made that mistake, I did my math homework wrong on purpose and I ain't fixing it, you are going towards entropy. You literally are not going towards the more structured levels of reality that sustain the architecture of being alive you're destroying life you every time you do that it's like hacking away at the timbers that hold up the architecture of reality when um, organisms don't take responsibility or live in denial or pretend it away or try to escape 
escape and evasion. Like, that wasn't me. Look, a squirrel. Then run away. Run away into the next dimension. Um, all of that hacks away at the uh, true um, upholding architecture of reality. And that includes the millimeter waves and the stuff like that that is trying to hijack your true experience as a DNA emanator. There are some very unpleasant intentions to destabilize time and to destabilize reality. It's like, yup, I'm here trying to destabilize reality. I'm like, no, like I'm trying to stabilize reality. Um, so the impulses, organisms, characteristics, creatures, entities, or non-entities, or never beings, or aberrations, or whatever it is, anything that doesn't add to the longevity of time, anything that doesn't uphold time and make time continue to exist has to go to entropy. That is what the flying rainbow lasagna is. And it is my contribution. Entropy existed before 2001 when I invented flying rainbow lasagna. But entropy was a long, torturous path where at a certain point, there's the heat death of the universe. That is, you know, this bubble of reality where it's like, there's no more stars to be born. There's no more gas in the car to go anywhere. All light exits through all black holes. It's like all cars leave the highway of reality. All exits are taken. And then you just have like a dead empty space that is super cold, super frozen. And anything that's there is just totally frozen and non-moving in time. That is called the entropic heat death of the universe. And when that happens, that is literally because all light, information, intelligence, awareness, and sentience has exited this level of reality, gone, I want to say hither, thither, and yon, has gone everywhere that you're supposed to go on your various consciousness journeys, and only the detritus, the stuff that's not even supposed to exist, gets left behind. And it gets left behind in an entropy state. But here's why it is not a state of suffering even at the state of extreme frozenness and entropy, which is non-movement, atoms tend to smear together and create a super dense state known as a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is when all of these atoms that are individuals kind of um, coalesce on top of one another and act as if they are one. So you have unity consciousness at the level of total fastness, total heat, total information, infinity. You have unity consciousness at infinity, where you're like, I'm everything. And the I that is everything is moving infinitely fast, and everything is there. Everything is there except for the stuff that is not there, because this is all the stuff that cannot move infinitely fast, that does not belong in an infinitely fast, infinitely expressed, alive state. It belongs in a state of non-being. It doesn't is, I want to say it is non-being, but just the most accurate way to say it is unbe, unbe, unbeing. There is no is, there is no it, there is no you, just unbeing, non-being. But in that non-being, there is also unity consciousness where all non-being smears together, acts together as one, and experiences its own direction of divine union. And that is because for some organisms, impulses, fragments, or whatever they would be defined as, there is not a pathway to get to God or infinite knowingness through energy. That would be like, look kid, even if you add up all the stars and all the planets and all the gas and all the gold and everything that could possibly exist in this whole entire multiverse, there still is not enough gas to put petrol to put in your car to get you to, you know, light speed. Not enough, it's just a mathematical impossibility. And that is um, a devastation if something has to wait, whatever, 17 or 13 billion years for the entropic heat death of the cosmos in order for them to be able to go to a restful state of entropy. Imagine just being like in torment for 13 billion years and the amount of torment and suffering that you would then emanate and generate outward into the larger system. So in 2001, when I created the Flying Rainbow Lasagna, it was for the purposes of restabilizing the fabric of space, time, and consciousness, keeping this body and this person alive, being able to backbend in time in order to come here and share these ideas with you, positively influencing you and your entire social dynamic and culture to move in a positive, uplifted direction, and also 
to create a direct pathway to entropy. And that direct pathway to entropy exists, like not like a doorway over there, like send them over there, send them over there. It is within you. That within your own genetic code, as you're learning this flying rainbow lasagna dance, you're learning not only how to oscillate into other realms and do these amazing portaling patterns and virtuosities, but within your own body structure, it's the capacity to turn down the volume on the songs that would be considered like pure crap. Pure crap, stuff that's about death, disempowerment, um, uh, decrepitude, keep on talking about these things, aging, um, becoming unhealthy as you move through time or in the presence of certain things. All of those stories that I referenced at the beginning of this class, that that is part of what you turn down the volume on. And so some of it now at this point is technological, but much of it before the technology came to our planet about four or five years ago was ancestral. A lot of things that got passed down through the proliferation of the cell membrane of previous generations that then went into you. And it might have been your zygote. It might have come from your mother's ovum and your maternal mitochondrial DNA that then got subdivided and subdivided. And it might have been all of these stories about, again, um, the necessity of death or about what it is to grow old, to be, grow de decrepit, you know what I mean? Like to have the body no longer be, be uh, functional and um, rejuvenative and um, energetic and um, turning down the volume on all of those stories and turning down the volume definitely on stories about particular diseases, cancer as a genetic disease, but also certain tendencies like diabetes or eczema or any of these, um, you know, metabolic diseases that tend to run in families. Turn down the volume on those stories that literally are not part of your natural architecture, your pristine genetic code or anything that you're supposed to be experiencing and exemplifying and sending out as music into the world to the people around you. Because here's a big takeaway, DNA is an antenna, it's a transmitter and a receiver and you affect and are affected by all DNA around you. And that is why you can't treat your life as just like, I'm just me, I'm looking out for number one, I don't have to care about anybody else and I only do what's good for me and I don't have to blah, blah, blah. You actually do have to blah, blah, blah. And guess what? Everyone else has to blah, blah, blah about you. Oh, Cheeky's talking down here. Cheeky gets to blah, blah, blah too. So um, yeah, I might need to take her for WALK -okay very soon. Um, so I will, I will wrap it up very soon. Um, but I wanted to get through a lot even though I had an extensive non, non extracurricular rant at the beginning of this um, sharing here. But Cheeky's talking a lot. I might really need to take her out. Um, Oh, cheeky girl, you're okay, honey. All right. So in, in light of Master Cheeky talking to me so much, let me just make sure that I got the essence of everything that's really important here. Um, flying <laughs> rainbow lasagna, cheeky, you're okay, girl. Flying rainbow lasagna is a seamless continuum between the two realms. Um, your realm of dream, dreams and imagining, your inner <laughs> realm, and a consensual third dimensional reality and your life becomes a seamless continuum of what you are thinking about and what you are experiencing. Um, you have more synchronicities, um, more, more examples of causality, like, hey, I think this thing, and then this thing happens almost immediately right in front of my eyes, and your inner thoughts and your outer manifestation. That's when I talk about something like thinking a thought and then seeing a crumpled up lottery ticket that says, win big, and then you're starting to see like, wow, the things that I'm thinking inside of me actually make stuff happen outside of me. And that's a big, uh, a, a moment of growth, personal growth and personal attainment to do that. Um, and yes, you are indeed manifesting your outer reality based upon your inner world of pure energy. The singularity point, not the transhumanist singularity, but the singularity that I speak about and that we have in this diagram right at the center here it is the point of God discovering itself. God discovering or remembering God's self. And the big takeaway is that the singularity can be in two places at the same time. This is the oscillation. As soon as you put it in a context, the hyperspace context, the singularity can be up here and be a state of total energy. Singularity can be down here and be a state of total entropy. So you could also envision that singularity as like a flashing on and off. Being, non-being, being, non-being, -being. be, un-be, be, un-be. 
And this is, again, not something that is external, out there. It's something that is happening inside of you, that this um, bringing into being and adding energy to certain things, being, and then taking away from, de-energizing certain things, unbe, happens inside of you. And this is part of your cosmic responsibility, cosmic job joy. Reading my notes a little bit more. So um, when you go through a time portal, you jump directly to the mirror position of the opposite side of the FRL. And when you go through the wormhole, you are emitted from the time vortex, a refinery of light, into a coherent beam. I hope this is making sense to you. Hold on. Some aspects of consciousness are not going towards being refined and being emanated. Some of them are going towards entropy or non-being. So that's what I'm trying to get you with this. This is what I'll end on. In this circumstance, you um, circulate from the general to the specific, so you're like gyrating wildly out of control, then you get more and more and more focused, and you remember, oh, I'm an ascended master, and I'm remembering myself as God. Some aspects of you and some organisms and impulses are on that journey. Remembering God's self, getting to that wormhole, and then being re-emitted into a higher dimensional state. And some aspects are not. So this is the part that I don't want to be taken out of context, um, because it's not uh, um, giving, not, give, not allowing, being like, that thing's just going to go to entropy. Let it run rampant and do bad stuff. No, it's not an excuse for certain things to run rampant and do bad stuff. It is the recognition that all of these impulses or energies are going to unity consciousness, but that that path can be defined as very wildly different for different types of energies or consciousnesses, and the destination is not the same. Unity consciousness at energy is not the same as unity consciousness at entropy. What it is a recognition of, like, if you ever had the idea of wanting to save, fix, or heal something, be like, come on, get on the ascension train. You're getting back to infinity. Or what many light workers are like, send them back to the light. It's beautiful impulse and being a little bit facetious, but not trying to make fun of you. But sometimes that's not the right thing. Sometimes with some impulses, they don't need to be quote unquote sent back to the light. What they need to do is be put into entropy, which is non-being. Cancer is a perfect example of that. It is a genetic tendency and a concerted effort, like a mutiny of your cells, that should not be in existence. And you shouldn't send it like back to the light. Like, no, it should go into a state of non-existence. Kaput. It should go kaput. It should not be in existence. It should go to entropy and not travel through time and not use time resources. And there are some organisms or entities or personality characteristics or imp, whatever you would call them, fragments, stuff, poops, doo-doos, that similarly should go to entropy. So they don't go to be like, go back and get your soul recycled and get refurbished and be a good person. No, some of them do not. And some things or non-things simply unbe. And there is a huge amount of appropriateness and freedom in that recognition. That is true love. Because when you truly love something, you're like, yep, that is a pile of doo-doos. And I do not have to somehow try to fix it, heal it, make it better, or make it acceptable in the world. It is just a pile of doo-doos. Send it to entropy. And you will recognize what needs to go to entropy as your higher and highest senses and accurate guidance comes online, as you become literate in the world and you are able to read like a musical score, the events of reality, and know what is supposed to exist and what is not supposed to exist, you will gain the capacity to be like, that's a wrong note, that should not exist, that goes to entropy. And you do it literally in your own body. And it is powerful and it is literally why you are here in a body that has DNA and is part of your responsibility to having this body not to just bumble along and be like, yep, that's all this crazy crap that's not supposed to be inside of me, but it's inside of me and I'm going to have to deal with it. Get rid of it. you got to clean house and get rid of it. That is your job in this life. Okay, so I haven't been looking at the chat because I've had my notes up here, but now I'm open to any questions, comments, 
or any things, let me get to any questions or comments that might already be waiting for me here, um, before I um, finish things up and then take someone down here for a WALK. She's playing, I don't know if you can hear her. Okay. Um, Pedro says, I guess higher beings, since they don't have DNA, they move differently in time. Absolutely. Higher dimensional beings move differently in time. First of all, we see all time as laid out on a banquet table. We see all frames of the reality structure at the same moment. And then you also see all the edits. Because when you have a movie, you don't just have one version of the movie. There's been the film editor that gave you like the director's cut and then the whatever, the TV version, and then this version and that version. You see every single possible version of reality at the same time. And you see time as an ever-changing, um, like a time crystal, a multifaceted object, a polygon of all of these different ever-changing reality structures. And every time one um, vector or ver variable changes, the entire shape of everything changes. So you can sense the future and you can sense and see multiple possible futures. But then as soon as something changes, you're like, everything just changed. Everything just changed. And this is why I always make my joke. I say, I'll save you five bucks. Like you're going to go get your tarot read or whatever it is. Someone's going to tell you, you're going to have a ham sandwich for lunch. It's like, okay, that might have been relevant when you got the reading, but then as soon as somebody made one decision in time, everything changed. Save your five bucks. Everything changes. That's it. That that's why you have to have your own time crystal up here so that you can see everything so that you can be constantly dealing with the ever-changing reassessment of variables in time. Melissa says, I have just going to read, I have thought that maybe the Putis started out as an impulse, which was strong enough to impress upon other minds, but waned over time, and now we are dealing with residual effects of an impulse which once was, but now only exists as rippled effects. Question to this thought, are we dealing the ripply aftermath of a pooty impulse which is long gone that's such a great thought and i really appreciate you as a long-term student and deep lasagna thinker so thank you for being here i think that's fair to say like time has so much of a changingness to its presence that we could say at one point there might have been entities that are what we would call pooties either something that never was alive that might be uh, an abstraction, or something that once had corporeal form, but that died horribly, died in a way that was unresolved, a continually unresolved thought form. But I don't even know if those things still exist, or like if Melissa asserts, if we are just dealing with the aftermath of them jumping into the time pool. They might have been resolved already, not according to clock time, but according to cosmic time, those impulses and characteristics and people and beings or whatever they were as an organism might already be um, resolved and no longer an issue. But their dirty socks, you know, the waveforms that they put into time, the way they destabilize time, we might still be dealing with that. It's a very valid possibility. So, and it, this is essential to know because what you're facing in every moment, like in, in terms of the peril or the challenges that you face in your attainment. It's constantly changing. So at one point, in a very valid sense, yes, it might have been an AI. Yes, it might have been an ancient AI, or it might have been the thought forms of an ancient AI. But then if you take care of that, then it's like, okay, we took care of that, but then there's the repercussions of what that thing made, or the thing that made that thing. So you have to comprehend that it can feel like whack-a-mole, like, I thought we just fixed that thing. Why are we still having problems? Because what you have to do is you have to fix everything from every direction. You can't just be like, I'm just going to fix these two things. Okay, these two things get fixed, but like, what about all of these problems over here? So in being a higher dimensional viewpoint organism or organization, you have to look at all time holistically and you see the ever-changing presence of time and you're like, okay, we're gonna fix that thing over there, but that's not the only thing that needs to be fixed. We also have to fix that thing over there and that thing over there because they're all interconnected. So once you start to really comprehend this in terms of DNA, 
This also relates to like different star systems, life across many multiple planets and across many multiple parallel realities. You're here now, but you're also in many other versions of reality. And so like some people recognize it, like you're like, I emanate from another star system. Like, yes, you emanate from another star system and you live there and you live here at the same time or your DNA is connected and your lives are connected. And that means that you don't just clean up the dirty socks in this life. You have to clean up the dirty socks in that life too. So this is not even just about incarnations within the planet Earth. Like you, whatever, you lived in the Revolutionary War or you were Van Gogh or Cleopatra or whomever you were. Um, you have to clean up stuff in those lives, but you also have to clean up stuff in uh, Alpha Centauri or a parallel life in another dimension that we don't have a name for or your life as a paramecium. You have to clean up all of these places concurrently and a, a better, more positive language way of saying it is that the ascension moment and the spiritual attainment happens for you in all of these places simultaneously. So the paramecium gets healed, yourself in a parallel dimension gets healed, yourself as Van Gogh or Cleopatra gets healed. Yes, there's a version of Van Gogh where he didn't kill himself um, and he had a happy life and went on to paint thousands of paintings, um, you know. Um, and yourself in Alpha Centauri. All of these things need to get healed. Um, and that's the amazingness of DNA. It is a continuum. It's a transceiver. Both send and receive on the antenna of DNA and it is non-local. So that means that what you're doing with your DNA affects people across the world who aren't in your backyard, also affects deep antiquity and everything for the future. And if you, that's why DNA is the real prize. Um, or thing that is being fought over in this world, I should say. People think that it's all about AI and that AI is the real peril and that AI is really the thing that everyone is fighting over in this world. It's small potatoes or very, very small inconsequentiality. AI is a tool. What is really being fought over in this world is DNA. DNA is, uh, the word epic doesn't even have a description. It is, its grandeur is unmeasurable. It is enormous in its span, almost incomprehensible to the human viewpoint of incredible value, of incredible beauty. Um, incredible divine intelligence is expressed through DNA. And there have been many, many attempts to subvert it and divert it and dilute it. This isn't the first time. Like, hey kid, this isn't your first rodeo. This is not the first time that this has happened. And every time the cosmos and DNA has a way to be able to respond to and augment itself so that these difficulties are resolved. So I just want you to know there have been many, many attempts to hack the system. It's like many, many attempts for like the um, safe crackers to try to get the gold that's in the vault. The gold is you, or the gems are you, and your DNA is priceless beyond compare. Um, but every time, DNA is protected. So please know that that is happening at this time too, but also please know that it is protected because of our efforts. And it is also part of the reason of why you are here. Not just to be a passenger, not just to be a baby infantilized in your high chair, eating Cheerios and doing nothing. You have DNA, you're supposed to do stuff. And same thing with the entire natural world and same thing with our whole entire planet is mandated to do something to respond in order to protect DNA. Joyce says, thank you, Professor. You are very, very welcome. So I will open the floor. Oh, any more questions? One more question. Um, Melissa says, love you. Thank you, sweet Aurora and wonderful Cheek. You're so welcome. Cheering for us, loving the new reality we are creating. Thank you so much for that positivity. Love received and love back. Cheeky's being very good and is waiting right there. Yeah, so oh, any more questions or comments that I can speak to, I'm so pleased to be able to um, respond. And if not, I'm literally gonna take Cheeky for her little exercise outside because she's been very patient all day. Someone's- Hey, Aurora. Yeah. I just wanna tell you very quickly, in terms of our interconnectedness, I was teaching my yoga class today. Right. And what came to me during the deep meditation was this image of a ceiling fan and how when the fan is spinning, it just looks like it's one thing, you know? But the slower it goes, you can see the manifest and the unmanifest. And when it's, you know, when it's st stationary, you can really study that. So it reminds me of so many things that you taught today. And I've studied with you so long, 
it probably came from something I learned from you, but I thought I would just share that quickly. Thank you for that share. It's so relevant. And I think that's a perfect analogy. I think that's a perfect analogy for time, our perception of time. And like you, um, you, you mentioned, when the fan is not spinning and then you're able to see each element and really examine mm -hmm. it in detail, but then we have a completely different perception of it when the object is in motion and it looks like a completely different shape deep, deep stuff there. So thank you for sharing. And I'm also, I'm so pleased to hear that you're uh, back to teaching your yoga class. I'm Big healing. Yoga. Much love to you and gratitude. Love received, love back. Thank you so much. Okay. Then, then I'm thinking I'm going to end the recording for right now, everyone. Thank you so very much. I'm going to take Chiki for her little exercise. Positive, positive encouragement and strength to each one of you that has DNA. And that is on this journey going towards energy. Wait, there's one more comment. I know I have to squint and look funny while I get, bend down to read this. Jillian, thank you. Jillian's new. Thank you for being here. Says, thank you, Aurora and Sweet Cheeky. So grateful for your time, perspective, and wisdom. Grateful to be here, resonating so much with what you share. Much love and many blessings to all of us. Thank you, Jillian. Thank you so much for joining the class. I'm so pleased to see you here. And thank you for um, being with us. And my classes are marathons. So I know sometimes it's three hours. You can do it. Um, and yes, thank you. It's wonderful to connect with you. Pedro says, love the lasagna. Love back to you. Thank you. Thank you for being a long-term student. And Lisa says, thank you for everything. Love you. Love received and love back. Thank you as well, Lisa. Have a beautiful rest of the day. Very real strength and encouragement to everyone who's got DNA out there. We're going to make it. Thank you.